when, you know, what's your first exposure to the fire service? Like, what, what's the first contact you had? The first contact with the fire service. <clears throat> well, um, it's actually a long and, well, I guess like many people, uh, it, it, it's unique. Um, I uh, did not grow up in the fire service uh, and didn't have any family that was really involved in the fire service, but uh, my, my family um, owned a small motorcycle shop. So just a family owned uh, motorcycle shop in, in Northern Illinois. And when I was about eight years old, we moved into uh, a, a different location uh, in Elgin, Illinois, which is kind of a suburb of Chicago. And uh, when we moved the shop in there, right across the street was a uh, lawnmower repair shop called Wilms Fix It. And uh, one of the really cool things about that shop was they, um, most of the mechanics were volunteer firefighters. In fact, they actually had to, uh, they, they retrofitted one of their rear bays to house the apparatus. Okay. So when they would get a call, they would jump on, they would put the tools down, they would go into the back, throw on their, their gear, and they would drive out. So the first uh, history I really remember with the fire service is watching these, these guys, uh, you know, tear out from uh, the back bay of Wilms right. Fix It shop, and and go on on whatever calls that they did. So, that was where I first was introduced to uh, the fire service, and and you know that that's kind of a you know such a cool traditional uh, you know volunteer fire service model. Um, yeah. You know th this the gentleman who owned Wilms and, and a couple of us in the community had uh, a a gap in their coverage. And so they said, "All right, we'll we'll fix it. We will uh, take part of this uh, this store and, and turn it into a, a a station. It was a substation of a larger fire department. Yeah. And then then all the mechanics said, "Yep, we'll do it. We'll we'll help and serve the community." Yeah, so cool. uh, so yeah, it was that was a really cool way to be introduced to it in in some of the. Um, so did it cross your mind back then to actually become a firefighter at some point? Was that like a childhood dream? You know, it, it wasn't. I, I grew up in a motorcycle shop, so my my childhood dream was to be a, a motocross racer. Um, you know, I, I wanted to to go out and, and you know, I was gonna dirt bike, fix motorcycles, dirt bike. Yeah, motocross, uh, all, all off road was, was what I was was yeah. into when we were growing up. So, um, so I, I really did not have this this uh, overwhelming desire to be a firefighter, but I had an incredible respect for those individuals there and, and you know you think about it you can as a 10 11 year old kid you could either sit around at the motorcycle shop and play with motorcycles or you could go over and hang out at the lawnmower shop yeah. and most people that would be a pretty obvious choice but <laughs> but there was something about wilbs that, that we we spent a lot of time over there and and learning from these guys and, yeah. and you know at that point i was you know a small kid i didn't think that i could ever do those 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 guys were were really truly the heroes that you you looked up to because it, it was so cool to see them in there. You know, everyone had the, the traditional mechanics, you know, clothes on, yeah. and you know they go into the back room and they come out. It, it was almost like a Superman thing. They come out and you know, but <laughs> that time the old three quarters and the long you know long coat, the boots, and <laughs> and and it was really just that this fascinating thing. But you know, I didn't have a history or a family history with it, so I never really thought that. Um, it's something that I could uh, could even do. Uh, it, it didn't cross my mind until much later in life that uh, that this is this is something that that you know really to help out the community you can do it regardless of, yeah. of what your background is and and whether you're you're working as a mechanic or you spent way too many years in college and, and can do it after that. Yeah. So. You wanted to be a dirt bike racer. Did that ever come come to fruition, or was that? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, I, I started. My my dad's theory was: as soon as you could walk, it's time to start riding a bicycle. As soon as you could ride a bicycle, it's time to get on a motorcycle. So I, I started riding off road uh, when I was about three years old. We had a, a little idle jet, which is an Italian little fifty cc motorcycle. I started riding that when I was three. And uh, they actually began racing motocross when I was nine years old, yeah. and and did that through most of, of my uh, formative years. My, you know, we didn't, um, you know, we lived pretty far out in the country, uh, so we didn't 
do what a lot of the stereotypical American kids, you know, playing soccer or baseball or football. You know, I, did, I didn't start playing football until high school in American football. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I raced motocross um, up until I was about 16, where I did really start getting into football and it kind of transitioned over there. But, but yeah, that was that was one of those things I got a chance to do at a, at a, at a pretty young age. And um, it cool. was it was great to learn that because that's also, again, my dad's theory was, you know, not only are you, do you have to ride, but you have to fix your own bike. Yeah. You know, this wasn't something where you, um, you know, dad's going to fix your bike for you. You actually have to do maintenance, maintenance on it. Yeah. So every week, clean it, fix it. Whatever you bent, you've got to straighten out. Whatever you broke, you've got to fix. You know, you got to do the simple things like making sure that that the spokes are are tight, the pro- the chain is properly tensioned. The, you know, every little piece uh, of of maintenance. You know, learn that at a very young age, and um, I, that's a pretty unique way to grow up to kind of have that understanding. Uh, which again was important when I went into becoming a mechanical engineer. It was really useful to have the background as a mechanic to understand um, when I moved on to becoming a mechanical engineer, how things really work um, and how the people who are going to fix them and put them together and do all those things have to deal with the designs that the engineers make. Yeah. So it, w- it was a really unique uh, upbringing in, in that perspective. When, when did you start thinking about like the, because it is, a, I mean, sure, mechanics of fixing a bike, that's it. But, but becoming a mechanical engineer, it's, it's, it's um, for me, it's, at least it's a very big leap. It's about not choosing to work with something. It's actually designing stuff and, and, and building stuff and understanding it at a deeper level. When did you, when you have that, you know, thought about actually perceiving something more in that direction? Yeah, you know... Well, my, my dad, as I said, owned the, the motorcycle shop. He um, he was actually a, a really self-taught uh, designer and engineer himself. So it, yeah. it was not a, a shop where basically you would go in, you'd plug a computer in and replace parts. Uh, my dad took a lot of pride in being able to to fix things, to... to um, not just replace a part, but in some cases to, to weld and to reform yeah. and to patch things <clears throat> and to to um, understand how things can be uh, repaired and reused and, and continue to, to work. And in some cases, even designing um, different, um, different tools that could be used uh, with uh, to fix the, the the motorcycles or to actually use motorcycles and ATVs in, in, in slightly different ways. So, so my dad, um, who who again was not a a what you would consider a licensed or traditional engineer. Yeah. You know, he, he went through high school in, in England is where the the end of his his uh, formal training was. Yeah. But he was one of those people who understood how to build things, how to how to make an engine work in a very unique way. Yeah. So I actually grew up in that theory, you know, understanding you know, very specifically, uh, you know, in terms of how to how to tune an engine, uh, specifically old carbureted engines. Really, all it is, is is a mixture between the fuel that gets injected and the air that comes in. And, and if you understand how you can, what are the levers? What are the things that you can switch? You can really tune that motorcycle in a very unique way that does not necessarily um, change the. Um, it changes the performance within the capabilities that the motorcycle has without doing some hot rod type of approaches, which other mechanics would, would do or other shops that were building race bikes would do. So, you know, being able to, to learn from my father about how to understand the machine is an important part of being a mechanic, but that also was really critical to understanding how the machine was designed. So, you know, I think the good mechanics really understand that. That's one thing that my dad really kind of hammered into me is understanding how the machine comes together so you can understand how to take it apart and put it back together appropriately, how to modify it so it can do maybe a little bit more and be used in various different ways. So, you know, even as I grew up as a mechanic, there was some of that unofficial training yeah. throughout that entire time. And I just happened to be good at math. So, you know, at that time and, you know, the early nineties, uh, basically anyone that was good at math was being pushed into engineering world. And, you know, it was just a, a unique aspect of all the engineers. It was obvious for me to go into the mechanical side as opposed yeah. to electrical or, or, or civil or anything else like that. Yeah. So, um, 
so yeah, you know, a lot of that came together to go down the engineering uh, road. But but you're absolutely right. They are two very different trains of thought, and and I spent a lot of my time as a mechanic cursing out engineers, thinking what the, why would they do something as dumb as that? I mean, it's about right. like maybe they do something that seems stupid, but from a production standpoint or financial standpoint, Absolutely. all those different things that you have to take into consideration. Like, well, we have this production line, we can make this part, and but if we wanna make this part, we have to buy a whole new production line and like we can't afford that. It's just so, so many different factors have to take in. But I think the most Absolutely. common one is that probably if you're a backyard design, you don't even understand the problem you're trying to fix yourself, you're just swearing because you can't figure out the real <laughs> problem. Like so, but but yeah, but yeah there is there is a big difference in between designing because it's so much bigger than it's it's. I mean, it's like me trying to like if I have an idea in my head, like this tool could be awesome for teaching firefighters, and I maybe do a, a model or something. Now mm -hmm. to take that from a model that I build in my garage, which is fairly simple to, for instance, if you were to do that in the production mm -hmm. sense, it's a whole different ball game. Like it's, it's very yeah. hard to make it work financially and production wise and get all the, you know, supply chains and everything working. That's, that's a whole different ball game. So of, 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 uh, of designing something simplistic enough to make it work like commercially is really hard. Absolutely. To, just, to, to go out in the, in the garage to build something one off is in comparison super easy right uh, which is is why you know it's amazing how useful some of the tools that we use and how long standing many of them have been i mean you think yeah. about the halligan yeah you know it, it's genius Simplicity. in terms of what it is it's, yeah. it's relatively simple but it, it is genius and it has so many different uses for people yeah. who know how how to use it and we have these very specific types of tools that we use and i'm sure there's some differences between the tools in sweden versus the tools in yeah. the united states but largely they're the same they've been tweaked for those specific types of construction or, or you know the, the types of doors and windows potentially that you might yeah. have but but you know, really they're levers and they they use simple physics yeah uh, so improving on them is really really hard yeah that's um, hard yeah 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 no so so you went to mechanical school and how that was mm -hmm. like three or four or five years so what, what was the mm. level well for a normal person it would be yeah so the <laughs> uh, you know after 12 years of, of high uh, school you know uh grade school yeah. junior high up, up through high school uh, yeah, so typically a four-year degree uh, yeah, four to, to get your your bachelor's in, in mechanical engineering. Yeah. And I went to the University of Illinois, which was the, the state. You know, I grew up in Illinois, yeah. and the University of Illinois is one of the one of the great um, research one uh, institutions in in the United States. And yeah. so it was it was an honor to honestly even to, to be accepted in into the the university. And um, so I spent the, you know four actually end up taking a computer science minor at the time. So it took four and a half years and began working for a, a professor who uh, said, hey, you know, I've, I've got some small jobs you can do in the lab. And at this point, we were using thermal imaging cameras. So, you know, again, this is mid 90s, some yeah. some really high end thermal imaging cameras at the time, they were 128 by 128 pixels. Oh, yeah, liquid, liquid nitrogen, which <laughs> got us, yeah, got us in all sorts of other problems playing yeah. around with that. And, um, but yeah, so so we began looking at, at that um, and, and doing some a technique called thermoelastic stress analysis, which we could talk about for days on on what that is. But <laughs> but a, you know, a tool to to inspect composites because there was this this big yeah, explosion how, in, in yeah. different composites being used. And uh, how, how so we said, hey, why don't you loads, work on that? How different loads react to? Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, how, the loading in there, yeah. the, the the matrix and the. the the reinforcing agent as well as yeah. the matrix, how you can match those up for different damage properties. Being, you know, this was when you're trying to, to save a whole lot of weight. So moving yeah. from some metallic components into some of these uh, ceramic and ceramic yeah. composites, and and so uh, so my my advisor had, said, hey, that you had want to get nothing to do with the fire service thermal imager? No. That was that nope. was that nothing. So so nope. back so at that time there was still no connection between you and the fire service. Like, no. Uh, it, yeah, quite honestly, it took me 12, it, you know, I, I was in school for 11, for, in, in college for 11 years. Yeah. And even by the, by the time I graduated, 
uh, the, the connection with the fire service actually came from my advisor, um, who, again, same advisor at that time I was wrapping up my, yeah. my PhD work. Um, after uh, September 11th in, in 2001, you know, there was a lot of, um, a, a lot of effort that was put into trying to understand um, what could the engineering community do to help support uh, our response to uh, September 11th, to understand how the, uh, the towers came down, uh, to understand what, what, what had happened as well as what could be done to help uh, the uh, the United States to, to be more zen. Department of Homeland Security was was brought online. My advisor actually uh, did a, a failure analysis for a class uh, that looked at the the, the towers, um, and that became actually something. The first thing I remember going viral. So he ended up going into uh, having a fellowship with the White House, <clears throat> and when he came back from that fellowship. Um, the Illinois Fire Service Institute, which is the, the state training academy for Illinois, yeah. is part of the University of Illinois. And and he came back and he talked to the director of IFSI. Uh, the director's name at the time was uh, uh, Richard Janey. And they said, hey, we need to really think about starting a research program uh, so that we can understand um, what we can do to respond to the evolving risks in the fire service. Uh, whether that's fire, collapse, hazmat, what, whatever those issues are. And it was largely centered around the, the, this growing homeland security concept or concerns, I should say, and, and how we could start to address some of those uh, concerns. So uh, that just happened to be at the time as I was graduating <clears throat> and uh, the tool that I was working on for my PhD, we had a, a a small business technology transfer grant to, to make that tool become a commercial instrument. Yeah. But that was only half of my time. And so uh, they said, hey, you know, we need to start up this IFSI research program. We need to formalize this IFSI research program. And I happen to have half of my time available. Um, so I was actually a little hesitant at that time. I think, well, I just go on this technology route. But but that is actually where Wilms Fix It kind of came back into it for yeah. me. You know, uh, you know, I'm trying to figure out what my my path is is going forward and, yeah. and to think about these things. And you know, I remember talking with my parents a little about the future and talking about Wilms and and you know, remembering uh, those those and there were guys at the time that that did those responses and and so. It was obvious to say, okay, yeah, I would love to to see what I could learn about this fire side. And, and again, at that point, we were doing infrared imaging. Thermal imaging cameras were really starting to become uh, a a tool that was used more regularly in the fire service. So it seemed like a natural transition. And one of those lucky coincidences, by far. Uh, the best choice that I ever made in my life, uh, <laughs> involving you know my my professional career, uh, not with notwithstanding good save, family. Good save, good yeah. save, good and save. And just good in case save. my wife ever sees this, <laughs> that was the best choice I ever made. Professionally, you know, yeah. I, I, that that memory of, of Wilbs really did help to say, okay, I want to do that. And then once I got involved, um, it, it my my attention really quickly shifted. To, to focusing on on the fire service institute you know the company did go on and commercialize the other the other part of the thermal imager went to the commercial side you, you never you never yeah. wanted to follow that path yeah there were certainly times where it was it was something i thought would be cool to go down that path but yeah. uh there was there's a difference between that was cool but working with firefighters was cool but there was also more uh that kind of you know, tugged at, at, yeah. at what I wanted to do. Um, you know, there, there's there's a lot of ways that people can contribute to society. Um, and, and engineers, I think, have a, an incredible ability to contribute to society. But uh, I wanted to contribute in, in the fire world. <laughs> right. Some, some, some. Right. Well, well, I mean, yeah, some I researchers to. just write papers for other researchers. And they're not. That's true. Needs that's, more research. That's just questionable if they, they, they produce anything of value, right. maybe. Right. But, 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 but yes, yes, a lot of yeah. engineers actually do. And I yeah. think mechanical engineers are probably the most productive in terms of yeah. actual use of the research being produced. But yes. I would agree with that. <laughs> but, but yeah, so I mean that was a long 
winding story to get to, to how I got introduced to the fire service. Well, it was after I'd finished my PhD, yeah. right? So, I mean, I, I was I was 30 years old by the time uh, I had, well, 29 by the time I, I started working at IFSI. But, but that was also where <clears throat> that was so interesting to me that I had to get deeper understanding of it. So it, I, I could not, just like I didn't want to be a mechanical engineer that didn't understand the mechanics side of things. So I actually joined the local volunteer fire department after I had began working at the Fire Service Institute. So, yeah. you know, within just a few months of, of working in that group, uh, you know, my a couple folks at, at IFSI said, hey, here's here's a uh, application to come work at the Savoy Fire Department, yeah. which covered the, the area where I lived at the time. So. So that's where I joined Savoy so that I could, yeah. um, you know, I wanted to be able to understand firefighting, not just from that theoretical perspective, yeah. not just from the engineering perspective, but get my hands on it and the ability to, again, to serve, uh, you know, the community that we lived in and, and to, to be you know, a part of that group was just fantastic. You know, I, I the culture in the firehouse I loved. I loved working with the Savoy Fire Department um, because it was a family. It was a group that trained hard. Uh, you know, we, we trained live fire training on a regular basis, multiple yeah. times per month throughout the summer. Uh, we had people who took it seriously. It was not just a, a, a club for people to go. Yeah. Uh, we had people who were proud of being able to respond and to make the situation better, whether it was for fire, motor vehicle extrication, you know, whatever else that was. We had a bunch of paramedics that, that really took pride in the EMS side. Yeah. Uh, so it was, a, it was a great group. And because I joined when I was 30, I had a really unique perspective um, on that. Um, yeah. You were the old guy, so, the old Broby. Yeah, no doubt, man. I was, <laughs> yeah, I, re I remember the captain who was assigning me the gear and, and he was you know, probably five or six years younger than me, but he also looked like he was 20 years younger than me. I'm like, <laughs> man, what am I getting myself into? Um, but they were awesome. You know, yeah. they, 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 they would uh, allow someone who, you know, had just finished their PhD and spent 11 years in, in, in college to learn and to grow and did not have preconceived notions about what I did and did not know. Um, and were willing to give me the grace of, of failing. Um, even though I was supposed to be you know, a smart guy that had all this schooling, they, they realized that there's a big difference between what you learn in college and, and what you're going to learn when, when you, boots hit the street and you, oh, you have right. to throw that ladder and use sure. those tools and you can learn everything you need to about physics. Yeah. But using the halog in the right way, it still requires you to use it, to oh, get yeah. your hands on it, to, to figure out how to not put your hand in the wrong place, to use the lever the right way and, and to, to ingrain that in your your mind, in your physical uh, ability so that you can do it yeah. at one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. Um, and so, yeah, it was it was definitely, definitely unique because I was so mature, shall we say. <laughs> We're going to get into your res uh, the research at IFSS IF IF I uh, damn it I IFSS <laughs> IFSS it, it, the problem is that you have you have the international fire associations uh -huh. uh, to say those this, it's, it's very similar to the, uh, the letters and I just make right. it entirely um, that that, that happens pretty regularly yes I, I truly understand that but before we go into research I have to ask you this otherwise the internet sure. is going to be mad about me. <laughs> Could jet fuel melt steel? Could that, jet fuel melt steel? Because that's the question. If you go, <laughs> if you Google nine eleven and the conspiracy, and it was a controlled detonation, you, that was called. There's no way jet fuel could melt steel so that it would collapse the towers. So can but, jet fuel melt steel? Well, um, I, we don't have nearly enough time to go into all the theories that, that came around there, but I think the important thing is it doesn't have to melt steel. No. Uh, all we have to do is raise the temperature to a point that it can't sustain the load above yeah. it. It's... And, that, and that, that's part of the problem. And you know, remember, this, this was 19 years ago, right? Just about 19 years ago. Yeah. The first thing I remember going viral, and that, that term nowadays means something completely different, unfortunately, <laughs> but, but you know, all of these theories are being thrown around out there. Yeah. And I won't begin to address the specific question that you no, asked. No, because... no, no, it's just easy. It was... <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but yeah, th that's where we, you know, we need to really, it, it, that's a very complex 
a series of events that occurred to understand uh, what happened there. So but, no, I, it, the internet will have to keep asking. <laughs> no, but it, it is. It, you you start having this. Um, I think it's a, you know, it's it is we look at that because it's such a that that incident is just one of you know you, a thousand since you could look at that's on the surface it looks it looks half complicated then you start scratch it's it's unbelievably complicated and when you actually get into the nits and grits it's just mind-blowingly complicated like how right. do you calculate structure loads when you have an airplane crashing in you don't even know which parts were damaged and so on so that's where you, it's just an example of if you're ignorant to not understand that it's unbelievably complicated if you're ignorant so to the point that you don't even understand how complicated it is then right. it's very easy to be go out in the backyard and make a pool of jet fire and try to melt steel and go look at this it was a controlled right. de detonation right but that's what i, I think <laughs> yeah. i think an example also between like you talked about halligan tool and being a mechanical engineer and understanding physics like that is it, it's it, it it's truly you can't get it get around it if you want to be a firefighter you need practical experience in whatever you're doing like a halligan you actually mm -hmm. go out and break you can't you can't look at a powerpoint and, and, and know how to use a use a halligan tool you can't be a mechanical engineer and know to use a halligan tool but on the other other hand if you only have the experience if you only practice with a halligan tool you will be very limited in, in what you understand and how to leverage. If nobody showed you anything, you can't try something new unless you want to try something new. Now, in Halligan, mm -hmm. it's, it's fairly obvious, but if you take something more complicated like fire, you become very, I would say, handicapped in the sense that you have a very hard time understanding what's going around. And if you haven't seen it before or have someone else told you about it before, if you see this, do this, uh, then you don't know what to do. So you have this, again, the, 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 the duality of you have to have experience or practical experience of what you're going to do, but without the, the deep understanding of, for instance, fire behavior, structural design and so on, it's very hard to, it's, it's impossible to synthetically create all the experience you need to a new firefighter and make them behave in a, in a, in a reasonable way. To me, yeah, to me, yeah. knowledge is sort of the shortcut to experience. Mm -hmm. Like it's synth synthesized experience, or at least you try to synth right. synthesize experience. Yeah, you know, th there's a reason that things have evolved a certain way. Uh, you know, people have learned from some of the experiences in the past. You know, that, that's why the tools have evolved and developed as they have. That's why we have the requirements for understanding fire dynamics and, and fire behavior and building construction. You know, I mean, for, for, for decades, we've been uh, understanding building construction. Books have been written that, that have really helped firefighters to understand building construction, how the buildings come together, which means we need so we can understand how they might come yeah. apart when, when we're faced with them. And, and those things have been evolving, not only the understanding, but how it's been taught, at least in the United States. You know, you, you have a series of, of textbooks, some that are you know, almost academic textbooks, some that are, are almost trade manuals, but such a, a, long, a large series of information that has been developed through the uh, years of history. But that is is an incredible an incredibly important point to to continue to move yeah. forward with to, to learn from what we have understood in the past you know the illinois fire service institute had been doing uh, some research going back to you know almost 90 years you can look there's an incredible historian at the illinois fire service institute dave Ehrenhardt. he works in the uh, the library and he has has collected a lot of information that has been developed because the Illinois Fire Service Institute actually is now in the 95th year yeah. uh, as being part of, of the College of Engineering. It began in the College of Engineering when they were doing these fire colleges to teach firefighters some of these things. And, and you can see the evolution of knowledge in these faculty members, even back then, were writing papers. They were heavily involved in, in FDIC, the Fire Department yeah. Instructors Conference, even before it was you know housed in what we know right now in, yeah. in, um, in Indianapolis contributing to that that knowledge base you know as we started uh, you know changing the way water was moved um 
you know, the different rescue techniques, seeing some of the old pictures of, of watching them throw wood ladders on some of the old training towers and, and the different tools that were used to affect water on the fire and to affect rescue. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that stuff has, has evolved over time, but not necessarily in the same fashion that we think about things being tested right now in the very controlled conditions in a laboratory like you might have at, at underwriter laboratories or at, at NIST or, or at many of the other large fire labs that are in Sweden and, and around the, the world. Some of that was done in uh, less controlled settings just in order to get an understanding of, of what can we do to help firefighters work more effectively. A lot of the, the research that was done at, uh, at IFSI 20, 30 years ago was what we might think about is, is some, um, some questions that showed up and said, hey, how can we, we're worried about this new lightweight construction that is being introduced into the the, into the construction industry because some of that was actually being developed at the University of Illinois. So they went outside and they built a couple of flooring systems and put some diesel pans underneath it and lit those diesel pans off and were calculating the difference in times to collapse yeah. between those different construction types. It wasn't a controlled laboratory. It wasn't a ASTM standard time temperature curve, but they were concerned about what was happening. This was questions raised by the fire service so that the folks at IFSI went out and they ran those tests. And, and we actually revisited many of those uh, many years ago uh, with Underwriter Labs and Chicago Fire Department. I think it was about 2006, 2007, where uh, Chief Mac McCaslin um, had these videos showing those, uh, those burns that were conducted and that was one of the things that, hey, we can do this now in a more rigorous and more repeatable manner in some of the, the laboratory furnaces at UL and Northbrook, Illinois. And we could repeat that with some of the newer technologies that are coming out. Yeah. So there has been an evolution of, of research um, over the, the last several decades. And, and obviously it goes back almost a hundred years in many places, almost hundred years just in Illinois. I'm sure in other parts of the world, even farther than that. So some of that is some of that would be counted as experience. Some of that would be counted as research. Some of it would be, you know, kind of somewhere in between those two. But a lot of that has been entered into our, our knowledge, has been adopted in fire departments, in standard operating procedures, in the red books, in some of these uh, uh, fire service trade um, training uh, magazines, as well as some of the, uh, the the training books that come out from there. So that is experience. That was experience that said, hey, we need to test this, and then we can bring that back to the fire service. It's just not nearly as efficient as what we have right now. I mean, uh, <clears throat> things come to mind is my, my favorite description of science is that the only difference between playing and science is, is that in science, you write down the results afterward. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just, which is well. I mean, it, it's sort of true, but it's. I yeah. mean, but if you want to be real scientific, you want to be able, re, be able to reproduce the results and so on. Right. But, but I think, like you said, there's a, there's a huge gap between. And I think that's been one of the, uh, somewhat's a problem, but also but also a blessing in the fire service because, it, like in the U.S. and like Illinois has done, um, there's been this whole range between what you can consider real science, where it's, you know, it, it's done through all the scientific scrutiny and all you have to write it in a certain form. And basically most of that research is written to get grants or to be published in other research articles. They are rarely written for the end user being, for instance, a firefighter, a, 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 a practitioner of some kind. They're usually written from that one. So they're, they're very, inaccessible to most tradespersons in that field of area. So they're done that way. Then you, on, on, on below that, you start to have what I would describe as backyard science, which is a huge range, but where you more or less trying to implement the scientific principles all the way down to maybe just playing you have no controls. You don't have any like you have no idea really about all the factors. You just write down whatever happened or you make a video of it. 
all the way down to that, which might be the lowest form of research you can do. <laughs> but at least you're writing it down, and that's mm -hmm. that's at least that's at least interesting. Um, right. But now, so, so 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 one of the problem, of course, is a lot of that backyard research has been just faulty. It's just been True. this is our experience, but we don't really know why it was causing this, and our our hypothesis, uh, our thought about it was just off so we've been implementing this in, in the wrong way or maybe should stop completely so a lot of backer science was was with good good intent but but bad badly executed which means you get bad results <clears throat> so but now we're moving into if you go back to 90s and, and 2000s that, that's where really fire research started to actually I, I think universally started to actually become done with the fire service in mind on the, on the on a bigger scale, and that in that sense also professionalized to a, to a certain degree, and and the development we've seen in the world of the, the body of knowledge from the late nineteen late nineteen nineties to two thousand twenty is just mind blowing, really, because yeah. it, it really went from backyard science and, and experience which a lot of those things are still true they're still good but the amount of research been accumulated just in that short short 30 years or something is just at least to me mind-blowing yeah i agree that that we have seen a, an incredible acceleration over the past probably 20 plus years yeah. uh, for the research, and particularly with the fire service. And that's not to to negate some of the important work that was done, you know, early 70s. Uh, you know, Dan oh, Madrakowski no. is a much better uh, historian than I am, but talks about some of the work that was done at, at NIST and the National Bureau of Standards before yeah. that time and back into the 50s. You know, in, in, in but all it the wasn't really accessible. I think that's the... Right. It wasn't... It Agreed. wasn't... It, and it was it was it was a different type of, yeah. of research, and, and yeah. it was it was not necessarily the same way that things are, are being done. And accessibility is 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 changed for a lot of different reasons. We have yeah, more tools course. to make things yeah. more accessible, but there's also maybe a little different approach. At, at least the, the approach that, that we commonly use at at, uh, at UL FSRI is is to include the firefighters at the very beginning of the projects in many ways to, to frame there. There's an advisory board that helps to frame the questions that we want to ask mm -hmm. that we believe are the next things that should, should be considered. And then as these projects on, you know, are, are formed, a technical panel advises them along the path. So that's one way that the UL is bringing the firefighters in from the very beginning. But I think we could even in the United States step back another level the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation, uh, since 2005, has, has developed this research agenda and has continuously updated that in 2011, 2015. We were actually supposed to update it again this year until all the travel restrictions came into place and, and will be again looked at in 2021. But that's the voice of the fire service to also say these are the things that we have, not just of a small group, but but hundreds of representatives of firefighters from across the country, they're saying, these are the questions that we need to have asked. So this is research that the fire service is investing in. This, this is the fire service's um, list of saying, these are the most important things we need you to look at, not necessarily how you should look at it, but it includes things from clinical studies to technology studies to very basic understanding of fire dynamics and, and training for firefighters. And I think that's a critical step. And one of the ways that we've been able to do so much research is the fire service now has a pot of money that they um, are, are wanting to make sure, it's not a huge amount of money, but they're wanting to make sure we're getting the best bang for the buck out of that. So the fire service is, is actively engaged in the US to say, these are what we need to research. And then helping the, the researchers to, to do that type of research itself. So that has really helped to research with the fire service and to make the uh, work accessible. You know, the tools that we have available, you know, obviously tools like this, right? Having the ability to converse yeah, about research is important and getting that out in multiple different forms, the internet, social media, all those things have allowed us to, to reach much deeper with the messages that were available. 
But I, I completely agree. There has been a lot of work that has been done in the past, and we are building on it. Even as researchers, oh, we yeah, build absolutely. on the work of, of Lane. Yeah. And even in the, the clinical side, right? Denise Smith yeah. started doing some of her research in the cardiovascular component, the, the cardiovascular strain of firefighting in the late 80s. But even that builds on some research that goes back decades before that. So we're, as researchers, also building on that, that history. And we have to understand the tools that we have to make measurements are improving. Oh, yeah. We didn't have some of that. So you can look at something in 80 and say, wow, that is a pretty simple study. <laughs> but just think about the core temperature. Yeah. What you used to have to do to get core temperature from an individual is you know, provide a rectal probe. And you know that, yeah. that limited <laughs> some of the things you could have them do as well as the people who are interested, right? Yeah. You didn't have a, whole, a large group. Whereas now we can give core temperature capsules that have a little radio transmitter yeah. and a thermal cup, a, a, therm, a, a temperature measurement uh, capability and transmission, yeah. and they can ingest the capsule. And now we can do hundreds of people yeah. in some of these scenarios where we used to only be able to do tens of people. And so part of that is the evolution of technology that allows us to ask questions, ask us, answer the same questions we were asking earlier in a more yeah. rigorous manner. So all of that has come together. And, and why some people don't understand why we might repeat some tests or repeat oh. some of those measurements, right? That that parking lot test of yeah. uh, engineered wood products and flooring systems was not controlled. It, it yeah. wasn't controlled for, for weather and everything else yeah. and, and, and wind and those other things. It showed that there's something that's interesting here we might need to take a look at. But now we can repeat it and get much better data in that furnace at, at UL and have more yeah. controls and put more controls around there and ask better questions and keep improving what we're focusing our research on. So that's how we start to, to narrow that down. But again, building off of that history and that, that experience that lives out there. Well, I think, I mean, <clears throat> two things. Well, first off, the the importance of baseline is, is, is so important to, to get across. I think it's poorly understood like the simple concept of just ab testing like wh what's your baseline what are you what, what are you what are you looking for what, what, what would happen if you didn't do this so i think that's that's critical and i think that's a, one of the to make backyard science better uh if people just understood the co simple concept of baseline there's, there's something to measure from when you mm -hmm. when you're trying something just just start with that and then you add something but people just skip that and and that becomes a problem but uh, the other thing I, I reacted on was I, I i remember i was in america and it was it was uh, uh it was during the time i think obama was president and there was uh the what do you call it the the congress was republican i think it was that because it was sort of a gridlock situation yeah. uh, and we, we were discussing just the concept of gridlock and it was a guy telling me i, I don't know i think it, maybe it was james mendoza is a great guy but anyways tell me like like the gridlock is no no it was not james it was something else oh, i don't remember but anyway it was just smart but anyway so that well because i was sort of like yeah it was sort of doesn't seem like a very efficient system like if you want to get stuff done that's that doesn't seem very efficient if there's like gridlock and it's fighting or time mm -hmm. and so like well it sure is because if 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 there's so many people if it's such a close call between things and everything it should be sort of like a gridlock because most people we shouldn't run in one direction if it if half the population wants something else and I, and I, and i and i started thinking about the whole that whole concept of that gridlocks and and uh, inefficiency has a lot of value like when you talked about the the technical pan for 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 for, U, for ul's testing i mean that's a, that's a that's been been or is fairly diverse which means that there's a lot of potential for gridlock there mm -hmm. <laughs> different people want to test different things for different reasons they have different uh, you know framing for that question and so on and different needs and so on um but that creates this uh, this this need for friction because if you take the example in Sweden, and Sweden has done a lot of great research. Like it, it's, it's accessibility is part of it because most of it's been done in Swede Swedish, so it's like that. And and half of it is backyard science, but it's fairly good quality backyard science. But it you know like it's poorly funded and so on. But when they take um, good scientists from like an environmentalist science and then you take some mechanical engineer and take someone that's a good scientist in their own fields and then they choose 
a person from the fire service to construct the questions uh, for them and, and maybe help them set up the, 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 the design of the, of the experiment, they will get the result, excellent work, excellent work, excellent work, excellent work, based out of those questions that the, the fire service expert did. And if the fire mm -hmm. service expert is a, it's a very efficient process because nobody's going to say, well, you don't do it in that case. You don't do it that way in the fire service all over Sweden. You just do that because you think that's the best solution. So that's why you want to test that. Because when I look at that research, I look at it like I can't, I can't take pretty much anything out of it because they've tested things. They've used the tools in an incorrect way. So the results they get with these tools become problematic and so on. So you have this need for inefficiency to mash out the good questions, which are at the heart of our research. What is the actual question that we're trying to answer? Because you, you're the famous you, you get you get you get the result you're you're, you're looking for. Like you, you could you could if you want to have this result, just you can you can make a question to get that result in a scientific way. So the, the concept of having the technical panel as a means to hash out the good questions, like you said, not really how, that's the expert of the scientist, but to get the questions, what do you want to test? And why do you want to test that? Because that's also part of the problem. I think that's critical. And not just, I mean, the bonus also is sort of some sort of credibility and it helps to spread the message and you get ambassadors and everything. There's all, all, all sorts of beneficial things by having a technical panel, but, but from a perspective of creating the, the best question, I think that's, that's been the genius. Well, one of the things that's been genius with UL's work. Yeah, I think there's a whole lot to unwrap from from, from that part. <laughs> but uh, to start with, I, I agree. I, I think you know when Steve Kerber began that process, you know when he he first came to UL and, and built the Firefighter Safety Research Institute, um, it, it was it was a very unique thing uh, in the yeah. fire service to have all those different voices. Uh, because you know even just within the United States, yeah. there is such a broad diversity. Of of the types of departments, yeah. the size of departments, the resources. I, I think we could just really capture that into resources, right? Whether yeah. it's human resource or financial resources, yeah. it's just hugely different. And, and part of the resource is also leadership, and, and how you can get individual fellowship. So even within the same department, depending on who your company officer is, you might be implementing very, you might be operating on very different levels. Oh, yeah. based on how well that group is trained, yeah. how well that group is disciplined, how well that group is ready to implement whatever the tactics or techniques that, that you would like to imply. So it, it's it's very, very difficult yeah. to capture something that works for everyone. So that's why this panel is so important to bring together concepts from around the country. And that's why listening is so important, not only for the engineers to listen to those uh, those firefighters, but for the firefighters to listen to each other. Uh, I was very fortunate to, to be in a meeting you know, maybe 10 years ago when we were talking about transitional attack, putting water on the fire from the outside. And there were some individuals from one of the largest departments in the country saying that, no, what we, that's just something that we don't do, that that's not something that, that is part of, of our, our playbook. And sitting right next to another uh, chief officer from one of the other largest fire departments in the country saying, you know, that's that's kind of what we do almost every day. That That is that is one of our uh, tools that yeah. is, is a pretty much everyday response if the conditions are right to do that. So it's not outside of the box for us. Yeah. So, you know, two of the largest departments in the country have such vastly different ways of looking at that same approach to, a, you know, getting water on the fire. And that has evolved hugely in the past 10 years. That, that conversation yeah. now yeah. would be completely <laughs> different than what it was then. But so there, there's there's a huge evol evolution in there. So first, and, and so let me just hold it. Why do you sure. think that is the case? What is your answer to the 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 massive differences in how to fight the same fire, or maybe at least a similar fire across the United States, but also across the world? Like, so what, what's your answer for that? What do you think? Why wow, you're really trying to get me already, aren't you? <laughs> no, no. I just said, well, like, what, what's how how does that come to be? I mean, fire is fire; it's just the same everywhere, and buildings yeah. are fairly similar wherever you go. 
What What do you think the difference is, license? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think we can. You're right. Fire is fire, right? It, there, the chemistry and physics of fire does not change, but there are slightly different mixtures, right? There, there's slightly different ingredients in that, so th there is slightly different environments. There is slightly different fuels in these mm. places. You know, the construction, it can be very different from, from even within, you know, a large city, you can have very different construction practices. So you might approach that fire very differently based on the construction practice. You might have different people who had success. I think, you know, a lot of it, if we, if we think about historically, what was successful in the past? And those are probably and again, this is this is outside of really my level, my area of expertise. But if I had to assume, I, I think we had people who were trying to find the best way to do the job. And in this part of the country, this approach typically worked more often than it didn't. Yeah. Whereas in a different part of the country, a different approach worked. Some of it might also have to do with the equipment that was available. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that really evolved the fire service, at least in my lifetime, and, and maybe even just a little bit before my, well before my time in the fire service, but was SCBA. Mm -hmm. Right, different departments adopted the use of SCBA at different rates. Mm -hmm. Firefighting PPE. You know, there were some uh, departments that held on to the old long coats and three-quarter boots for much longer, so they didn't have the thermal protection to others that went to bunker gear right off of the bat. So those that went to bunker gear and used SCBA maybe had more ability to do some of the interior work th than some of the others that just wouldn't have that thermal protection or that, that uh, protection of their airway. So you can see just the kind of evolution uh, of... of animals right there, there's an evolution as, as people are adapting to their environment and i would imagine that we're seeing a lot of these changes across the country and around the world are people who are trying to do the best they can by adapting to their environment and have found it is more likely to work this way than that way based on what they've learned throughout their their time and and so that's what i would propose as a possible answer to that question and it wasn't wrong but it also, you, you, it, it's hard to to really assimilate what is truly the best way when you have these large organizations and, mm -hmm. and even within that organization, if you're high, fighting a high rise fire versus a single family residence fire versus a strip mall fire, I mean, there's very different things that might work best, tactics, coordination, it might work uh, more efficiently in that scenario. So we need to continue to evolve. And, and I think research is hoping, the, the hope is that research helps that evolution to occur where you don't necessarily, everyone doesn't have to learn in their own jurisdictions and evolve locally. Maybe we can integrate some of the knowledge from some of these larger studies and help that evolution process to occur because it allows you to have different perspectives. It allows you to understand how does the big city fire department addresses versus how does a, a, a suburban department versus a rural department. And not only that, by having video cameras all around these structures, you can get the view not only from the nozzle operator and the company officer, but the person who's doing outside vent or an individual who is trapped in bedroom A versus the kitchen. What are the conditions and how does all of that vary? That wasn't available in the earlier evolution. You basically had those individual people, and, and depending on how good their their debrief was, you might get multiple different perspectives of that fire. Now, with the studies, you can get all of those camera views and all of that data and, and numbers that you can use to help this evolutionary process. Um, and and I, I think we'll still continue to see things done differently in different places because there still is different building stock. There still are different resources, but this research can hopefully help to help us understand why that is the best choice. The research isn't telling you this is the best choice, but it helps with the information. Say, okay, this is the best choice for my reality. And I think that's where, where hopefully we can add a whole lot of value in these studies. Well, I mean, going back to baseline, you're creating baselines. In this situation, for this house, for this fire, this crew, this nozzle, this happened. Like, you, when you arrive to fire in a slight or smaller building, that's where knowledge comes in and to you because you have to fill in the blanks. Like, how would right. that change this scenario now? But I think, like, like you said, there's, I think that, like, evolution, every fire service has grown on to be, 
to think that we are the best. And I think that was true that most fire departments in the world thought they were the best up until probably 10 years ago. I think 10 years ago, the knowledge about other fire services and how other fire services were doing it and the research become so available that I, th I, I see a, a clear path towards fire service going like, whoa, like we're not as good as we thought we were. Like we're, we, we could probably see some improvement here. I mean, I think that was pretty universal like 10 years ago or maybe 15 years ago, but it was sort of like, it's not long ago where I think a lot of farces w woke up and said, maybe there's more than one way to skin a cat. Like there's, hmm. there's, there's multiple ways to get to the end game. And sometimes I think, and I think that's the problem. Sometimes five different solutions might yield the same result. Like, like, and you can, you can, and everyone's going to argue that, 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 that their system or their, their way of doing it was the, the best. Yeah. Well, that, that's an interesting perspective because that, you know, and I think a lot of that has to do, I think people are now more aware of what else is out there, right? Because yeah. of social you media, know. you can see, right. Yeah. And you can see what other departments are doing and how they're doing and what are their approaches. And there's also now cameras everywhere, right? So yeah. you can see your own event. Right? Yeah. You can figure, you can see different angles of what you've done by by different bystanders taking taking video. So I would agree that people are probably much more aware because they can be. Because other than the people that go around the country or around the world and, and buff fires, and there were a number of those, right? There were people who did do things like that, that, that went out and watched how other firefighters did their job, would travel across the country to to um, to learn from those other fire departments. So it's just, it's easier now, it's just right? much you easier. You, 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 we, we scaled up the few individuals yeah. that traveled the country. They weren't enough to get traction. Right. <laughs> they changed it things has, locally here, locally there. Yeah. But to get to That's, the scale where, where yeah. But I, one of the things I, I really enjoyed when I first started working at the Illinois Fire Service Institute, this is back in, in 2004, I went to fire college and I was amazed at you know, it's it, it's a large training organization, yeah. but you go and, and you listen to firefighters from FDNY, from, from New York, John Norman is, is giving a presentation in the middle of, of Illinois. Uh, <laughs> their firefighters are coming from across the country yeah. to teach. And I think that was a relatively special group because- Yes, you know, that, our, that is the local- yeah. We, we had a deputy director who was engaged in the IFSTA process. So he would yeah. go to help work on those books and folks from FDNY, you know, the John Normans, um, you know, you've got just a, a few people, the Andrew Fredericks that were involved in there that would come to Illinois and, and teach these things. But it was hugely impactful to have those voices from outside the state of, of Illinois. And, and to this yeah. day, we still have individuals who come in and do that and, and help to teach that. So that was something that was really unique about um, some of these programs that would reach out to other parts of the country. So I think that has now become easier for us to do that, to get those perspectives, just because of, of you know, again, podcasts, yeah. webinars. Um, you can have access. To L.A. County provided people access yeah. to some of their training platforms. Yeah. FDNY puts out the FDNY Pro, so everyone can learn some of that. Not not necessarily all of that information, but can learn some of that information. So, so that information sharing is, is critical um, in order to to learn from each other and make us more aware of those that are out there. So uh, yeah, yeah, I think, I, it's, I think it's a great like, thing. It's always a great thing when we try yeah. to say what can we do better, uh, like, but yeah. also realizing that we can't do, you know, Savoy Fire Department, a 40 to 45 member volunteer fire department in central Illinois could not do what the Chicago Fire Department could do, right? Which is a 4,000 member fire department in, in Northern Illinois. Even though we had people, they, those were the people we looked up to, right? When they would come down, you know, it was, it was amazing to listening to them and learning from what they had done and what they had put into place, but we couldn't possibly do that. It, it, we could not do all of the things that they did. We didn't have the resources to do that. Yeah. It doesn't mean we couldn't learn from them and try to improve our operational reality with the lessons that we learned yeah. uh, from, from those folks. No, we we need, really need to get going with what, what I was supposed to ask you about, really. <laughs> but I think, I think that's a really, I, it's very important for me to understand like where people are coming from a little bit, like the history of each individual, because it shapes 
it shapes perspectives and perspectives are hugely important so i think it's very interesting for my personal sake yeah. but i want to get into like more like because i don't really know the research you started with in Yentel, illinois was that focused on firefighter health already back then from the from yeah. the aftermath of 9 11 like the the exposure of, of different uh, substances afterwards was that you know started? actually yeah so the the work that we'd initially um that i when i came into the illinois fire service institute uh, we were not really looking at the chemical exposure aspects of things uh denise smith was a uh a researcher who who was a full-time professor at Skidmore College in upstate New York, but she began um, her research career at the University of Illinois. She was a PhD student at the University of Illinois, and some individuals had brought her on who were asking questions, and this was during the transition in, in many parts of, of the U.S. from the old long coat, three-quarter boots into bunker gear, and there was a, a significant concern about how that would impact heat stress and then in, in her mind, how that heat stress would impact cardiovascular stress. So she'd been doing some work uh, off and on with the Illinois Fire Service Institute from you know late 1980s, early 1990s. And, and just like much other research at the time, there was no money for it. Uh, you know, it was it was poorly funded. So you know, begging, borrowing, and stealing to get equipment and to get tools from from different labs on campus in order to do some of these very initial experiments trying to understand the heat stress, not only of, of the gear, but different firefighting activities and training yeah. and how that translated, you know, from how much do you heat up to how does that impact your blood and your cardiovascular system, looking at the heart and looking at the vasculature and all of those things yeah. as well. So when we st stood up the Illinois Fire Service Institute, the first thing that we did was how can we resource this great research that Denise Smith has been, been doing over the last decade or so? And through the Department of Homeland Security, uh, which, which at that point includes, who still does, where FEMA became a part of that, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, there was funding available. And so one of the first things that we did was try to understand, again, nothing related to, to my, um, my graduate work, yeah. is how can we develop a project and to go after this funding that's available so we can have a much better understanding of the stressors that the firefighting environment puts on the body. And how can we do, if we could properly resource this, if we could move from those, and, and it wasn't backyard experiments because we were, she was using controlled yeah. training props with controlled fuels and timing and everything else like that. It was not, uh, you know, a controlled laboratory experiment. She did yeah. some of those, you know, yeah. in an environmental chamber, on a treadmill. Yeah. So this is how you can get from something that's incredibly controlled. You can have firefighters walk on a treadmill yeah. in thermal neutral environment or in elevated temperatures yeah. and see how does that change when you put them in, you know, three quarters and in, in the long coats versus bunker gear. Yeah. And that gave you a very interesting solution. Not surprising that when you do that, people in bunker gear heat up more rapidly and have higher heart rates and all those sorts of yeah. things. But then what's really interesting about some of her initial work is she said, all right, now we take that and we'll go out into a training tower yeah. and we'll have people do some typical work, you know, uh, pulling a line, doing some uh, fire suppression, some, some typical training activities yeah. in the two different types of gear. Then lo and behold, it turns out that those firefighters are going to work as hard as they can, regardless of what gear they're in, they're, they're getting near their maximal heart rates. Yeah. They're working as hard as they can so their core temperatures go up. And so you get a different answer. There, you don't really see a whole lot of difference when you add that level of reality to the question. So you give up some of that control, like our, our earlier but discussion, it, like, right? You but, don't have the control. Yeah. but you, yeah, so you, you don't have the control, but that control does not match reality. You can't get that laboratory environment to match exactly what the reality is, is during those training environments. Right? So that was that initial study. And we've gone from there. Now you got, how does training match the reality of a real structure right. fire? That's a whole other level, which is what we're now evolving into at this point. So I'm sorry, I interrupted you there. No, I, I was trying to interrupt you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because you, because it, like, so what was the conclusion? Like, because you could argue that like sure you're working in in three quarters bunker gear bunker gear or three quarters that old what do you call it mm -hmm. three quarter boots and three quarter boots yeah and the wool, long coat 
long code. Yeah. 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 They'll sleep it and both work to their maximum ability, but if you have in a non very hot environment, uh, you would have be able to do more work with uh, three quarter boots. So did right. they also work like efficiency or did it, like how much work you could do you done? Yeah, great question. And that, that, that was the difference, right? So the heart rate, peak heart rates were about yes, the same, same. Heart temperature about the same, but the people in the three quarters actually were able to complete the tasks more rapidly yeah. than those in, in the, the fully encapsulating bunker gear. So again, that's why, and I think going back to our earlier discussion, there are limitations for every study that you set up, yeah. but it's important, first of all, for us to understand and to clearly state, these are the limitations. This is why in the papers that we write, you know, you've, you have to be very upfront about this is what we did. This is the yeah. protocol that we implemented. And usually that's based off of whatever the literature said, you know, what's been done in the past or what is specific to that question but also indicating this is the limitations of, of this study. So if Denise had just ended by measuring heart rate and core temperature, then you could argue that oh, no difference between these two. Yeah. But by also looking at the work that was done and trying to look at it a more holistic view, that additional data point now can tell you something additional, right? That yeah. it might not affect, if, if your endpoints are just heart rate and core temperature, no difference. No difference. Your endpoints are how quickly you can get the job done. Now that's a completely different answer that you're finding out of this. But a lot of the standardized testing can be done by saying, okay, you're going to sit on this treadmill or not. So you're going to, you're going to walk on this treadmill at this specific pace. Right. And in that case, yeah. everyone's accomplishing the same amount of work, but now you see differences in, in the gear itself, yeah. right? Now you would see the differences between those two types of gear. So that's why it's important as we move from this high level of control, which you can get in a laboratory, you, you can get with a flame, you can get with a yeah. bunch and burn or a candle, you, you, can, you can do some very controlled experiments and then move out to these full scale structures that, that, that UL that we're currently working on right now, there's limitations to that. And we have to make sure that we understand that this is not exactly what you are going to see, but the lessons and the trends that we gather from this by controlling the things that we can control, controlling ventilation or controlling yeah. suppression, these are the lessons that come out of them. That doesn't mean that this is going to tell you exactly how to do your fire attack. So it's a trade-off. But as long as we are open and, and transparent and, and people understand, most importantly, they understand what those limitations are as they're trying to figure out how to apply those research learnings, um, then we can make uh, some steps forward because that allows you to to more efficiently and more realistically put those research results into play. Well, I think that again, talk about the accessibility. I think that was the, the thing with when I when I look at research. I mean, I, I I see myself as part research communicator or research aggregator, filling the blanks, explain research. Sort of that's one part of what I try to try to do. Mm -hmm. And when I look at research, you go like, you find kind of like suppression, for instance, you find someone with a Bunsen burner and they put some suppression agent into the Bunsen burner and they look at like, what levels do you need for get suppression? How much the temperature drops? What happened with the oxygen levels? What happened with CO and so on? What kind of products come out of it? And you look at that and by that, by that test, you can look at, okay, should I use dry cam or water or should I use some mixture in water and so on? But that test doesn't tell you anything about how it's going to work in real life because you might not have that perfect way of in introducing the suppressant. Like you're not having a perfect flame and you're you're pitching right in. It's about flow movement of, of flows. Like maybe if I put suppressant in here, maybe it doesn't even reach the flame. It goes in another direction and, and completely voids the result. So when you look at the baseline, which is how does the reactant work inside the flame, you get an answer, but then you have to work in a different, maybe a different entirely, especially before, you know, UL, effort, uh, UL started and, and this, you know, sort of, but then you have to look at this suppression study here, and then you've had to look at some kind of like laminar or turbulent flow study over here, and you try to mash those two together, like, is it likely that the, the thing we put in here is going to reach this and actually affect the outcome. It, it was very hard to make this these baselines come together in some sort of practical sense. Does it work in reality? 
the baselines, like you say, you have to make the, the boring, maybe non-realistic tests in the lab, highly controlled to know the baselines, but it might end up when you put it in, in, in the real life that it's sort of like, yeah, it doesn't work that at all. But you need yeah. the baselines anyway. Yeah, absolutely. It, and, and it's critically important to understand, you know, the more you can control, the more you can hone in on yeah. what exactly is the cause and effect, yeah. right? If a perfect experiment is that you have everything exactly the same except for one component, and yeah. you're just changing that one component in a very controlled manner, you know exactly the in and out, and you can measure everything perfectly. Yeah. Right? We, we know even with our, instrument, our measurement instruments, there's some range uh, yeah. of, of their accuracy. Um, and we also know that we can't necessarily control everything. Uh, fire, Especially not with fire. Fast. It's just, right. yeah. I mean, you, you look at some of these, the re repeated uh, scenarios that UL has run in yeah. the past in full scale structures, just burning a couch. Yeah. You know, it's been done probably nearly a hundred times and you can see how variable that is when it's yeah. the exact same couch in the exact same structure. You need to take it out of that structure. You, you burn that same thing pallets and straw for a fuel yeah. package. Even yeah. if you burn that very simple fuel package over and over and over again, you're gonna have some spread in that data. Yeah. And so that makes it hard to, that makes it more challenging to find that cause and effect relationship, which is why again, we need to do multiple. If we can do multiple, then we can compare this five tests done this way with yeah. this five tests done this way. Then we can use statistics to tease that out. Yeah. It's not nearly as straightforward to explain, yeah. but we also, if we compare one this way and one in this approach, that, that can, that can be challenging. That five, could be two outliners better. that you're right. trying to measure yeah. between. And... and even with five, depending on the variability, yeah. that might, the overlap between those might not be enough. Ideally, we would do 30, right? 30, yeah, I mean, can get in yeah. easy statistics then. But, you know, that becomes very, very expensive. So, so right, you're right. There's huge value in those laboratory, those baseline experiments where we can control all of those components. But even those, as those are written up in those those pure physics yeah. and chemistry studies that are critically important for us to yeah. understand fire dynamics, there's limitations on those as they scale. Yeah. And scale probably isn't the right term because fire does not scale well. There's so many different pieces yeah. of flows and heat transfer and, and all these different things that they just don't is just well. goes through the roof right so so that's again why we need to be transparent about yeah. this is why in the laboratory scale this is why we're choosing to focus on this specific component of of the fire environment and we need to understand more about the other pieces or if we go out into a larger scale structure these are the limitations you know on one day it was raining and the other day it wasn't. That will affect the environment. That will affect the lift of smoke in some cases. Mm. Wind 10 miles an hour from one direction versus zero the next day will, will affect those results. But it's also important to understand the huge variability that the firefighters are gonna to respond to because that that's that's reality, yeah. right? You, 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 you might have a 10 mile an hour wind. You might have a 30 mile an hour wind on, on one day and you might have none for the exact same fire the next yeah. day. And so we have to understand what is that range uh, and how does that range just in the environment help us? So as, as we build this up, those are important pieces to understand it as, as we build up the knowledge base of fire research. Uh, we can only do that with more and more attempts to start teasing out some of those differences. So going back to the bunk gear versus the three quarter pants, mm -hmm. boots and... The long coat? Long coat. Yeah. yeah. When you're in America, you, 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 people talk to me like that. No, that's true for every country, but generally it's it's more pronounced in America because I'm maybe because I'm there. You, people always talk to you as everyone knows exactly the same thing, right? Like so, so it's this is you're like well, doesn't everybody know three quarter pad boots <laughs> and long and, and long? Yeah. Well, I've seen it on picture, and I you know, I, but it's right. not like I've wore it. <laughs> yeah well but anyway uh going back to that one so we have this we have this this result that you're uh, like denise was getting that uh, and you were part taking part of it that you get the same heart rate you get the same core body temperature and that is of course is the limiting factor and that's also what's you know increasingly gets dangerous when you get too high of a, of a body core, uh, core temperature we'll get to that later but uh when you have a, a, a soft a, a less insulative 
protective gear, you could do more work. But of course, that is, that is only valid up until the point where you're adding more external heat than you're getting internal heat. So there's like a point at some place. Like there's a point source where where you, if you if you go to that point you can't well physically at some point you can't even be there because it's too hot because you're not protected but it, you're getting too much external heat versus internal heat. Now that led the, the experience with Swedish Fire Service. We got thicker and thicker bunker gear when 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 we SCBAs came along and we we got bunker gear way before like most countries like we had bunker gear in the like in the late 70s we were getting bunker gear and and we had S, we had the first pressurized scba and so on so the, the experience was very long ago and right. the interior attack became of course the most prevalent and you go deeper and deeper in uh and you didn't spray water on smoke so you penetrated as far as you could until you saw the fire and then put some water on it it was basically um you couldn't do that tactic without a, a very very high ins insulated bunker gear and the rooms were small ikea furniture so it was just dark and mess and no ventilation so mm -hmm. it was it was obvious that we needed thicker bunker gear but last 15 years 20 years maybe the trend has gone the other ways you know the most departments choose lighter bunker gear. Now, there's many reasons for that. It's, you know, like most work is not done at fires. So like at ro road traffic incidents and so on, you need a more, less insulation and so on. Now, now a lot of departments are switching to two gears, which is the right approach, one for fire and one for everything else, which is what every department should do because you wouldn't need a very insulative person yeah, that, working a road traffic. Like, like, yeah, I mean, do you support those? That is a, that's fantastic. Is that, that's yeah. common now in, in Sweden? To have oh, the two yeah, yeah, well, yeah, it's starting. It, it, most, uh, most departments, I would say, is making some kind of switch, at least the bigger ones. Now, I, I would, no, I haven't seen, when I say common, it, it would say that more, more than 50% have it. I would say more than 50% is probably going to get it when their mm -hmm. sets run out of, you know, the, 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 the their, when they have the not budget cycle to get new clothes and so on. Maybe it's, it's in the process of switching because again, you're having dirty gear. It's not even, we're gonna talk about that. It's not even s s sure it's being cleaned when it's cleaned. Even if you wash it, it's not sure that it's clean. Why would you bring those contaminants with you? And why would you bring that to other people? And why would you work in that, in that bunker gear when it's, there's, it's not even suited for anything else but fire? So, so that was part of part of the reason why thinner gear in Sweden was starting to get more more okay. traction. But the other part was also that it was it was if you purely look at fire, the technical advances in, in PP went better, so it could stand a lot of heat even though it was thinner. Uh, but it was that I think it was that anecdotal experience of of if you're getting too insulated, your 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 capacity to do work just goes down so much that it it in the end you're not being more effective because the simple answer is the, the more insulation you get the more heat you can take the more effective you can be which is absolutely not true unless you're constantly fighting a fire inside a flashover which i would heavily <laughs> advocate for thicker gear <laughs> but if you're if you're working i would say smart with with suppression and ventilation so that you're pushing the heat away from you you're you're minimizing heat by early water and so on then you're probably not going to have a ton of heat and in that case th thicker bunker gear you 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 pass that point of 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 improvement and you probably want thinner gear yeah you know what you just but, described I'll, I'll, is very... I'll, I will I will answer with a question so okay. how do we and do we know where that line is no you don't have a uniform, a uniform level, level yeah. of, ex, of, of, of metabolic exertion and of course, you don't have a uniform level of, of exposure, yeah. right? Because as you're moving through this structure, we know when you, when you get in the front door, many cases, you know, it, it, unless the flames are rolling out that front yeah. door, you might not have a heavy heat exposure right there. It yeah. might be when you get farther in. And, and at the same time, we also know that radiant heat is one of the most 
critical components of heat transfer in the fire ground environment. So time, distance, and shielding can all help us when we're dealing with radiant heat. So the same person, the person in the same place that, that is behind a door versus having a door wide open can have very different environments in which they are being exposed to. So, I mean, in a, in a basic thing, we would like to say, yeah, we, we can set a trade-off based on this is the exposure that you're going to be faced with. This is what your interior uh, heat generation is. And we yeah. kind of think about those in the U.S. There's two different measurements for a gear, TPP and THL. And I'm assuming it's a very similar type of measurement that has to be done for a gear in Europe as well. But But what's that uh, thermal protective performance, that's yeah. the insulation, and then the total heat loss, that's how, it tells us a little bit about breathable, how it can get yeah. rid of some of that heat. And those are the levers that we have right now to spec our gear and, and NFPA standards, 1971 for the US, NFPA 1971 tells us, these are the minimum levels that you have to have yeah. for those two measurements. And, and that has been set based on what people think are the best uh, provide the best trade-off yeah. between yeah, breathability and not. And, and again, it goes back to what you what you were saying there on a broader level is what's that exterior heat? How can I get protected from that heavy radiant or, or even convective exterior heat versus how can I get rid of that interior heat generation from the firefighters themselves? Yeah. But just like questions about how do you put water on fire, it's not that easy because <laughs> you have it a, never a whole is. lot of different it never I, yeah. is because so, like your concept is there but th that's not easy to translate into no. a, a technical hypothesis or 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 a a specific requirement for the gear other than tpp and thl which is is really what it's done here most regularly in the us so one one exercise i sometimes do at, when i do instructor classes is that we 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 <clears throat> we have a, a room on fire and outside the room there's a flow path coming out and we're sitting we're, we're rotating around and they, the instructors have their they have latex we're going to get to particulars also but they have latex gloves on uh, below their pp which is in some countries they go <gasps> <laughs> but anyways <laughs> yeah we got no, i didn't hear that no we laid this glove on and the we exposed the the back of the hand different places to feel just to, just to feel how hot does it feel here? How hot does it feel here? Feel the layering. Yeah, structure. feel the layering up and down, but also different places inside a room. Like it's it's hotter. At, maybe if you're in the flow path by the door, it's hotter and it's colder in the corner, even at the same height and so on. So you, they get a feel about where the heat transfers, like and what is convective and also but what is con uh, 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 radiation. And when we do that exercise, it's, it's again that that could be a topic for looking at. If you're if you're standing in the wrong place and wrong time, the the heavy bunker gear is is your good your best friend. Like if you're sitting mm -hmm. in the flow path, and you have flames rolling the ceiling, I want to get you know, like the thicker bunker gear you can have, the better. Right. But if I work in a sense that I know where to not to be, don't sit in the doorway, just sit a little bit off. Like don't work here and then you're the the lighter bunker gear is your friend because you it, it allows you it allows you to do more work before you're you're, you're done um and i've had instructor classes where i've said and i've done this mistake many times because even if i say before the class like don't be macho this is not a competition about who can stay in there as long as you can they all tend to, to look at me as the instructor, in that case, the lead, to decide when do we get out, when do we stay in, when do we put water on the fire, when not to, and they just kind of follow. And what I did is, it's a very poor error of mine, I positioned myself in one place and sort of like, okay, here I'm gonna sense the environment, and if it gets too hot, I'll order everyone to get out when we're looking at sort of a fire behavior and so on. Right. But then I forgot that someone is sitting in a doorway, like half a meter beside me. And they were starting to go like, yeah, Lars, I have to go out. And I was going like, yeah, sure, go out. To me, it wasn't that. But they had the like, gear that was starting to melt and so on. And they, they went out way too, too, too late. That was not my intention. But where I was sitting, it was like, like no problem at all. And that was like three feet apart. Yep. So you have this massive differences. So, so that again, the complexity of saying, okay, so what is the average exposure you're getting to a firefighter during a fire? Okay. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> you know, 
We've got a, another great example of that. Uh, Joey Willie, who, who now is a, a research engineer at ULFSRI, he was a undergrad at uh, at Illinois, and uh, one of his projects while he was working as a research undergrad was to to develop a helmet that we could take in and we could we could map out what is the heat flux and temperature uh, in these different training structures. So as you're going through these training scenarios, as opposed to having things fixed in the walls or or at locations, then you can see actually what are the firefighters exposed to, not yeah. not just what is the exposed to. Yeah. And so he built a helmet and a backpack and all this that was allowed um, allowed those data to be collected in a, in a portable manner. Yeah. Uh, this was probably, oh, maybe seven or eight years ago. It's now been published in Fire Technology. But one yeah, thing that's really interesting about yeah, you've probably seen that. Yeah. Um, so in the fire behavior scenario, one of the last ones that we were doing, we were in what is sometimes called a flashover simulator or, or a phase one, yeah. you know, basically we you're, you're creating that rollover, and yeah. the students are down a little below that. And, and Joey and I were in the uh, in, in the student area, and we had another person right behind us. And we were we were right next to each other. Yeah. And in that scenario, Joey was watching because he was collecting the data. He was actually he he was he only collects where kind of you're looking because that's the you know the the yeah radiation is going to be along those lines. So yeah. he, as he's paying attention to those rollover class, he's looking up and, and I'm sitting right next to him. But as I'm doing, I'm kind of looking around, yeah. you know, checking out the rest of the environment, doing other things. And at some point, he was like, hey, I got to go. Yeah. And it, the temperature, we look back, the temperature never got above 50 degrees centigrade. Yeah. Well, maybe for a very short period of yeah. time. But his face piece started bubbling. It started actually getting hot enough so that it would form some micro bubbles and some cracks. And actually, we have a, a picture of it that, that we often show. Even though the temperature never got anywhere near the melting point or even the glass transition temperature, we might start to expect to see some of this. Yeah. The radiant heat heated up his gear. I was right next to him, and another person was right next to him. Neither one of us had even the slightest hint of damage to our face pieces, the same yeah. model of face piece the same age and there's no reason to believe there would be a significant difference between them yeah. but that difference was that he was viewing the radiation directly viewing it for a straightforward period of time whereas we were kind of looking away and things yeah. cooled off so even that very subtle you difference differences yeah. in that case you could pull your sleeve off and you could feel the air and it would feel warm and you would have no indication that that is creating enough uh, a, enough of a thermal insult to damage that face piece yeah so it, just, it shows us, again, some of the challenges of if we want to provide a warning to firefighters, how do you make that warning? Yeah. How do you tell Like it? a flash of warning you, device? Do, 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 remember, do, 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 do. Yeah. <laughs> there's been a lot of work to come into those. But even that, if you have I would a, love one, heavy, but, I, but it's very hard. <laughs> yeah, right. But now you think about it, you've got all that thick, heavy gear. You might be protected inside of it. Remember, that gear is absorbing all yeah. of that energy. It's, it's still getting that same radiant heat yeah. transfer and effective heat transfer if they're in that flow path there. Yeah. And so at some point, it will eventually defeat that, uh, the, the, the thermal protection, even of that really thick gear. And then yeah. you've got something that has a whole lot of stored energy in it. Now you've got something that may be even more challenging because it has more, as you get out of the structure, it'll absorb more and potentially deliver more energy to the skin for a longer yeah. period of time. So even that is a trade-off, you know, yeah. in terms of, of the ultimate protection. Oh, it is. I mean, again, like the, where, where it should have been obvious 10 years ago, uh, and it should be obvious today, is that most fire departments need to switch to two set of gears. Like there's practical problems in that. Like you have to, like if you go to a road traffic incident and you have your road traffic gear, which is just good, breathable, protective or abrasive stuff. Uh, if you get a fire just afterwards you need your bunker gear somewhere in the truck like that's that's sort of a practical problem and and so, sort of some of those but it should be obvious that you do, don't need to contain all that heat when you're at uh, with a, fighting a forest fire or road traffic accident or a medical call you see people run around in bunker gear go like uh, well i've done the same thing because we only had one set of gear and when i you right. know where i'm part-time now we only have one set of gear because the department i'm at where I'm a retained or part-time firefighter right now, uh, they don't see that as a as an important thing to do. <laughs> Needless yeah. to say, I, I don't agree. 
But you're, you're right. There are, it's the practical reality. It's the resources, you know, departments that have multiple sets of gear. I think it makes perfect sense what you're, what you're referring to, to, yeah. to have gear. You know, it would be great to have a modular concept, right? Where yes. you, you can change. And it's something that, that, that Bobby Halton, Chief Halton has talked about for years is, is look how the, the military often has things that you dress for what your hazards are going to be. Yeah. You, you don't necessarily wear the same thing at all, all the times. And it would be great if we could get to something like that, that we, we well, there wear. Is, well, is well there, is, there is in Europe. There are manufacturers. Yeah. Does, I, uh, there, you're right. There is, if, if that could become more universal. Yeah. Um, budget are always going to be yeah. an issue. Um, and, but that's something where, what is the risk and benefit of, of not having, of wearing your bunker gear that may be contaminated on yeah. a medical call? And how can we start to make those uh, arguments or those discussions so that you can understand what is the risks and the benefits of each. Because I, I agree, if we could get to that point, that is a, a solution that would, I think, move us in a much better direction than where we are for those who do wear one set of gear for everything. But you've also hit on there are practical challenges yeah. uh, of doing that. And quite often, mostly that revolves around how is it going to be resourced? Yeah. Um, and it, that's in in reality that is important oh, discussion yeah, to have. Absolutely, but I mean, it generally, generally, I mean, it, it's harder for volunteers and and full and 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 part time. I mean, if you don't get a lot of fires, the the gear is being thrown out usually because it's sort of just too old, not because it's damaged. Now, but if if you, for a lot of departments who, are, who run mo more calls, it's being thrown out because it's damaged. In that sense, getting two gears is not more expensive. It's, initially, it's more expensive, but 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 it's in the long run, it's not because why would you why, why would you use a, a I know what in in dollars a fifteen hundred dollar bunker gear and and being you know crawling on the ground at a road traffic accident and damaging it when you can have a, a $150 gear, which is top notch and, and, and make that, you know, damage that at a road traffic incident. So it doesn't make sense to, from a financial standpoint to, to, to have not have two gears. Like it makes a lot of sense financially, I would say. But now <clears throat> this, the hard question is again, like going back to like, if we get a little bit more into if we just talk fire because nobody cares about road track actions. It's <laughs> firefighting where that's what, we... <laughs> yeah. of course, of course, I hear rescue, road, hazmat, and so on. They're all pretty much useless. Uh, we, <laughs> you said it, not me. <laughs> no, but I can do that now. yeah, but if you look at fires, like to decide for instance for, first of all like the thickness of the gear that's that's an interesting one and again i can only say anecdotally that sweden switched to a thinner one and mm -hmm. i and i think that is I, I you know i've seen some of the thicker ones in just some departments in the united states have really thick ones yes. Um, yes. and and i would say I, it has to be and often in hot climates too um mm -hmm. i would say it has to be such a uh an effective um effectiveness problem in, in, in even mundane fires uh, that it has to be I think it's a poor trade-off but it's hard to tell me where that line is like where does yeah. where does it gets too thick and so on because you of course you want to get into to, to further in and, and fight the fire you don't want to be feel you don't want to feel limited by your gear right uh, and and realize that also a lot of our a lot of the protection is for somewhat worst case scenarios. Yeah. You know, the, the gear, you know, we want to be protected if things go south, you know, but the challenge is what is the percentage of time that, that yeah. things are, are going to go bad, that, that you get trapped, that, that, that there's a disorientation, yeah. that there is a, a mayday that requires that level of protection in order to, to make it out safely. So we, part of the, the high level of protection that's put on these is a safety factor. And we really don't have, um, you know, a, a whole lot of understanding of what is. But it's, how do we it's a safety. That? It's a safety trade-off. I think it's a, exactly. it's a fa yeah, exactly. safety factor. Is is is. You kind of get the impression that you're 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 increasing safety, but you may sacrifice efficiency. No, you're just increasing another danger. Like, of course, you know, like heart heart cardiac problems and so. You know, 
that, that's you know one of the things that we try to do in, in in many of our studies is is to look at it with multiple different endpoints in mind. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we we use the term holistic, though we can never be a completely holistic. We try to, uh, you know, we we try we try to include as many perspectives as possible. So. You know, going back to when we first started at IFSI, uh, you know that, that first project, Denise had done the work looking at the, the different types of gear well before I got there. But when I got there, we started talking about how can we get this funded and not just look at the heat stress, but look at biomechanics. Look at, at not only if you design the gear differently, it affects you know maybe the breathability of the gear in terms of how you might get rid of some of that heat, but also affects uh, how you move through the world. It, it affects your flexibility. It affects your maneuverability and those sorts of things. So one of our studies, we said, okay, in addition to looking at the heat stress, we brought in some experts in biomechanics to say, how does this affect our balance in a functional balance? Yeah. How does it affect you just walking on the far ground or walking over obstacles, something is, you know, like a, you know, a supply line or, or yeah. walking, stepping up over a curb or up and down steps and those sorts of things. And we started to combine those two so that we were not only addressing how does that affect heat stress, but how does it affect your risks for slips, trips, and falls, which in the United States are one of the leading causes of injuries yeah. on the fire ground. So we began to add those two components together. And then we began adding in other things. It, it, you know, the chemical exposure aspect was, was something that had been discussed in the U.S., but it was not a a focus that it is right now, you know, it's been understood that there were risks for cancer in the fire service. Dating back, uh, you, you can find papers back into the 80s and even before to, under, yeah. to, to indicate, look, there's some bad stuff in this smoke. But it, it really hadn't gotten to the forefront of the U.S. fire service until there was a really good paper from Grace LeMasters that kind of helped open people's eyes. And then, then in, you know, around 2000s, early 2010s, NIOSH began looking at a large group of firefighters from Philadelphia and Chicago and San Francisco to look at 30,000 firefighters and really say, you know, what is the relative risk of certain types of cancers compared to the general population? And saw an increase in risk for, for several types of cancers. And in recent years, that has been done around the world, right? We've, we've seen yeah. some similar types of studies in Europe, uh, in particular in Europe and Australia and the United States, but you know, all, all over the world. So as we started now looking at, at other research questions, we, we try to be more holistic by adding biomechanics into heat stress. Yeah. And realize that's what a lot of the gear had been designed, right? Initially, the gear was designed to keep water off of the firefighters. That's why yeah. you know, we had the long bill. That's why yeah. it looked like a raincoat. That's why we had the long boots look like waders. Right? It, was, it was around protecting from water that it would get on, on the firefighters. Yeah. And then we started adding these other things, added, you know, it has, had to be able to, to be tear resistant because otherwise you would just destroy it doing the work that the firefighters have to yeah. do. Then you start adding in thermal protection. And for a number of years, the driver of that discussion on, around gear was really that trade-off and thermal protection. Like yeah. if we're going to go in fire or if, if we have these thermal exposures, how do we protect for that as well as the trade-off in terms of heat stress and again, that metabolic heat generation, how do we make that balance? Yet, how do we still do the job? How do you pull ceiling when you've got a heavy backpack on yeah. and all your restrictions around your ability to move in your upper body? And how does your ability to bend over and lift things get affected by having fully encapsulating bunker gear that bunches up as you move around? Well, now in the last, say, I would say 10 years, maybe less, we've really started focusing on how do we protect from the smoke more so than just SCDA. Yeah. I, when I first started, you know, 15 years ago, I really only thought about protection from smoke. And, and, and just in my simple view of it was, well, that's what we wore the SCBA for. So we didn't breathe that stuff in. Yeah. I never really thought much about protection from absorption across the skin. Um, and, and maybe that was just my, you know, no. I, I just didn't, didn't get it. But 15, I think that's years what ago, 15 years ago, nobody thought about that. Nobody. And, and so we didn't, we're evolving even more. Yeah. So now we're trying to figure out how do we make this gear that is breathable yet provides us a high level of thermal protection, allows us to still work and move and do the job as yeah. our biomechanics aren't overly affected. And now we're saying, okay, now it's got to also protect us <laughs> yeah, yeah. from smoke. In our initial, it, so just to show where we're at on this, this yeah. transition right now, we initially just looked at soot. 
right? Yeah. So the particulate, because that's what you can see on the body. When someone gets yeah. out of the fire, you know, and, and I've got pictures that I'm not particularly proud of anymore. I used to be, it would come out and just, you know, covered in, in soot. And you could, yeah. you could, you could see that soot on there. And so now we've started to try to t tighten up these seals so that you don't get the soot that comes in around the neck and in, in, in through the coat and up through the yeah. pants and all those sorts of things. But we're also now starting to realize that it's not just that soot that you can see. You know, some of these bad actors are vapors. Yeah. Some of these bad actors are coming in, in in gas phase. And now what do you do? Now if you seal things up so that some of those vapors, benzene, for instance, might yeah. be in vapor phase in the fire, naphthalene is largely going to tend to the vapor phase. Now that's a whole other level of trade-off because that is going to keep make it less breathable. Uh, if you're going to seal up more seams, it's going to be harder to move around. Yeah. So we're adding more and more challenges to the gear that we have to face. That, that so you're we're saying it's the team. hazmat team is going to be the fire heroes in the future? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> because that's not realistic, right? Because that, that's no. the balance. We yeah, so that's a trade-off. That, that's a balance that we need. Right. And, and again, that's why this is really, really hard. And the studies that we're doing now, it's not just, you know, Denise and her expertise in, yeah. in exercise physiology, who, who understands all the metabolic heat generation and all those trade offs that, that you were discussing that she's still teaching me after all these years. And, and you know, myself as a mechanical engineer and, and Steve is a fire protection engineer to really understand what is going on in the fire environment. But then we bring in guys like Kenny Fent from NIOSH who are the industrial hygienists who can really understand what is the bad stuff that's being produced by some of these fires that, that gets into the air, that gets onto the gear, that gets onto the skin, and then gets into our body. And these things that are introducing are, are, are potentially affecting our risk for developing cancers or, or many other negative health endpoints that, that we're just starting to uncover at this day and age. And you can't do that with just one group of experts or scientists or, 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 or tools, right? We all bring different tools to, to address that question because we're asking our gear to do a whole lot, a whole lot of things to protect us from all of those different things at a fire. Yeah. And then realize that in, in many of the scenarios, in many cases, in many departments, those fires are few and far between. You're much more likely to go on all those other calls that we'd likely, you know, that we, we yeah. tend to gloss over occasion. And so that's why a modular set of gear that Chief Halton talks about or or two different completely different sets of gear, it makes a whole lot of sense yeah. to be able to go that way if if we can resource it. So yes, I want to get to the particulates and the the Yeah, you you have all day, so it's not a problem. Um <laughs> If Steve gives you a hard time, just tell him to call me and we'll square it out. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm worried about my kids at this point. <laughs> no, so first I want to jump back into the the thermal just one more because uh, you talk about how the how the how the how the gear works uh, in terms of removing heat and so on. Now I had a, I remember I had a chat with uh, a UK guy who's responsible for PPE in the UK, and it was it was it was a couple of years ago, maybe five years ago or something. And they because in the UK they've started implementing modular gears. I know it was fairly common then, you know, normal bunker gear, but they had a two set jacket. So one jacket, the inner layer was for like road traffic accidents, and with the fire they just took on the other shell oh, yeah. for, for thermal protection. But we discussed the Swedish, because Sweden always had, always now, like 1980s or something, started with exterior right. hoods over the helmet. Mm -hmm. So we had mm -hmm. the, the the cotton hood, the flash hood, uh, which which most firefighters, at least today, have below their hel their mask, which is in America also, <gasps> just like having a beard. Right. <gasps> <laughs> but anyway, so, uh, start having an exterior hood and and what I then thought was like why don't everybody have exterior hood because it gives a much more thermal protection around the ears and so on and the UK guy said well that's just stupid because most of the most of the most of the energy comes from inside and when you when you have an external ho external hood without a big hood uh, an opening here you, you your clothes don't work as a heat pump you know that you don't pump that heat away uh, and I was go like, ah, that makes sense. <laughs> because like those kind of design issues where, again, you're going down to for thermal protection, the exterior hood was great. 
Now, mm -hmm. in hindsight, we didn't know back then, but now it's a great for for particular exposure because you seal you seal more. I mean, it's it's not completely sealed. There's openings, but you get at least more stuff out of it, right. assumably. <laughs> at least not, yeah. at least the visible stuff like soot and so mm -hmm. on. At least there's one more barrier to get through. But then again, they created another problem, which was it, it encapsulates more heat. So right. we get thinner, thinner gear, which breeds better. But maybe the most important factor to get heat out was that heat pump effect. And we, we're sealing it in with the exterior hood. So we're trying to yeah. go like, when I start thinking about that, and I have no say about PP in Sweden, which nobody listens to me, but I go like, we're trying to, we, we, we're up here, we have one philosophy is keeping heat out and in. And here we're trying to adopt the philosophy of we need to get more heat out and they, they don't match. <laughs> right. yeah. That's not like, the, the, yeah, that's, they, I don't they, think they, that was common knowledge in Sweden that it should work like a heat pump, like oh, the, yeah. uh, the air pump. Yeah, and, and that's also something now that, that a lot of the gear in the United States are trying to get rid of that pumping aspect. So that's why you might see yeah, yes, uh, almost yes, yes. a start, right? Because yeah. not only does that pump that moves heat, but also yeah. that will help Pumps bring in some of that environment, yeah. right? So, yeah. so again, it, it's all a trade-off. And at this point, we it would be ideal if we have a series of numbers that we could, a leverage that we could just adjust yeah. and find what that optimum is. Uh, but but we're we're not we're not there yet, and uh, I don't think we're anywhere close at this point. Well, there was but a, at least we're we're identifying yeah. some of the hazards, some of the things that we didn't know. You know, it, yeah. as as we just said, 10, 15 years ago, the the, the risks for cancer, for occupational cancer in the fire service, were not nearly uh, as as apparent and well understood as they are are now. So now we can try to do something about that to reduce those risks, but we're still in those conversations in all sorts of different areas, not just on PPE, to realize that there is, we're trying to reduce the overall risk as far as we can. Yeah. And if we drive the risk down, if, if we get to the point where we have zero burn injuries, what is that doing in terms of some of these other risks, yeah. right? So so there is that trade-off that we have to understand. And, and if we force someone to, to fight fires in a hazmat suit, as you just said, I mean, look at all the other risks that that brings up. Yeah. Right. So, so it might work for one, but if we're not looking at it from a holistic perspective, then then we then then we may be missing the boat here. I think that I think that are, in terms of gear, I want to. Uh, there's multiple questions I have more, so, so yep. don't go anywhere. But one, I there was a, a department in Sweden, uh, in one of Sweden's bigger cities, that for many many decades, or at least a decade, probably more, <laughs> uh, used uh, overalls instead of two two part. Mm -hmm. um, and they used it for because it was convenient and so on, had nothing to do with particulates, had nothing to do with, 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 with uh, you know, thermal detection really. It was just a two piece because they preferred it and so on. And, and mm -hmm. it, they moved away from that because it was probably 10, 15 years ago, probably, I, I would assume they started uh, stopped doing it because there was many, it was very few manufacturers who did overalls, uh, but it was also that it was convenient to take one off, you know, doing other stuff and so on. It was before right. the air, air, area, it was before the idea of having two different sets came about also. Mm -hmm. But anyway, when I look at that, and they still those designs still exist to buy, and I look at that like buying a, a, a thin suit uh, with good good you know seals at your boot at least you know like so that it's a good seal down at the boot and some good seals at your arms, uh, a collar around your neck. Um, that, that's the hardest part, but <laughs> but maybe somewhere on your part, make it sort of not like a hazmat, but more more sealed, um, but still fairly thin, so you don't get ton of thermal protection, but at least you get good breathability. Somewhere around that, I would guess, I would I would place my my two cents as the trade off right now. Uh, to get at least less of of those areas where you have air going freely in and out, like you say on the air pump. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think we're starting to 
get to the point of understanding what those trade-offs are in a little bit more rigorous manner. Um, and, and I agree with you. At some point or another, we have to figure out what is the likely responses you're going to have. And, and it, it's going to be very different based on the, the department or, or again, yeah. depending on maybe yeah. even what you're assigned to within department. We all yeah. know, you know some of these large departments, there there are some stations that, that are, you know, not running that many fires, whereas you might go to other stations where you can expect, you know, yeah. a fire each shift at, at least one. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's there's a huge variability there and even within those individual departments. So that might require, you know, some some different specking of the gear based on on what those individuals or what that department might be uh, might be faced with in terms of their uh, realities. One of the challenges is though that you know the more you specify that, the more you make it it uh, one off and, and specific to your conditions, it's likely to become more expensive. Yeah. Um, because you you want something specific, yeah. So that that's always at the end of the day one of those most important trade offs is is what is the cost and and we've seen some great new materials and new designs that have come onto the marketplace uh, over the years, um, but oftentimes those come at a, a premium price point, yeah. um, and and you know over time those will start to come down and everything will improve. But uh, again, that's where a, a whole lot of it. A whole lot of the decisions have to be made based on what can someone, uh, what can a department actually resource. Yeah, and uh, like you said, it, it, there's there's this hard to to define those trade offs and and those persons and people to buy buy gear. I don't envy their job because it is it is mm -hmm. that trade off, and usually, yeah, different different experts within that department require different things and again when yeah, the road traffic incidents they say well don't give us heavier gear like don't give us heavier gear and, and fire i would say erroneous say we need thicker gear because we want to go further into the fire i think that's a that's a that's a that's a problem because again mm -hmm. you limit your workability your ability to do work right. maybe it's a better word <laughs> yeah. workability is that even a word if it is i just invented it I and I'm, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so, uh, but yes, but okay. I think that one, one of the, I think the thing that was missing in the, in the early days of when, when cancer started to become a problem and people recognizing that this is caused not only by not wearing your SCBA, this is skin absorption and so on. Um, one of the things that was definitely missing from the start was the, was the, was the connection to tactics and strategy and so on. Because it was, I mean, typically in, in a fire service, if it was an injury, let someone, you know, someone, someone burnt their hand in a fire, the answer was get better gloves, more thermal mm -hmm. insulation or whatever. It wasn't that, well, maybe Johnny who wore the glove was in the wrong place. Maybe that individual skill wasn't up to par. Maybe the, the individual skill of using hose line wasn't, wasn't bad. Maybe they should have read the situation better and positioned himself beside the door maybe it's a training issue maybe it's a tactics issue they choose the wrong the wrong tactic they shouldn't even be in there they should have done transitional attack maybe it's a wrong strategy maybe they should have gone defensive whatever meaning there's so many ways of addressing that problem with the burnt hand and just giving right. thicker gear is probably not the best one I'm not saying that's all the case. Of course, we should have good gear, but like it's the right. simplest answer to a multifaceted problem. And I think that for me, because it, it at least today, when when we are faced with that trade-off, you know, if do you want thermal protection, and yet in that case, I will get less work done. If I need a lot of work done, I have less thermal protection. But if I want more work done, I need more airflow. But if I have more airflow, I get more more particulates under the the the, the garment. Go like, fuck! I don't have it. The simplest, which is not the simplest in in in, in reality, but the simplest answer is uh, spend less time in smoke. Just spend less time in smoke and spend less time in dense smoke. Meaning. I mean, be as quick as possible and get the smoke away as fast as possible, which is good for rescue, which is good for property conservation, and it's good for for people for for the for the firefighters. So the objective of getting knocked down in the fire to and get to to be able to aggressively ventilate the structure to get rid of it should be a much higher priority of reducing cancer 
than buying better gear at this point. Like, because the, the gear is not the solution, at least not today, but we don't know and we yeah. don't have the solution. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think just listen to what, what you were saying there, it strikes me kind of as, as uh, when we think about the hierarchy of controls. And so there, there's multiple different levels of controls. In the United States, this is often attributed to NIOSH because that's where we see it most regularly. Like there's, there's different things that you could put in place to control the risk from, from an occupational standpoint. And, and you know, the hierarchy has, has typically five different levels. In PPE, is is really the lowest level and generally considered to be the least effective of all those other things elimination like if you could get rid of yeah. fires altogether obviously that you can eliminate the fires then that is the highest level of controls that provide the most protection just by physically but we, we don't hazard. want that we don't want that to be right. no okay. just just to be clear we don't want less fires just to be clear no. <laughs> but, but in, theory, the in theory i understand that that's a possibility <laughs> Believe that, well, we can't do that, right? Well, honestly, through community risk reduction, you might be able to reduce some oh, of those fires. You might be able to eliminate those fires yeah. by 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 educating the public. So there's other things: yeah. substitution, engineering controls, administrative, all of those things. And administrative controls is kind of that. It's the next level up for PP, and that's kind of how do people work? Can we change the way people work? Or, you know, engineering controls, can we isolate people from, from the hazards that are out there? Yeah. So there's different things that we can put in into place. Now, in the fire service, my read, again, not having anyone that specifically told me this, is that, that we often rely on PPE because we just don't know. Yeah. The, the fire ground is, is, is different. And, right, you, you rarely will know exactly what you are facing on that fire ground because – the fire is so going to be so variable. Even if we know exactly the structure, exactly what's on fire, all of those things that we talked about earlier are going to affect it. So the the only way that we can protect people from all of those is to have this PPE that can can provide that um, flexible protection that we have. But what you're talking about is what can we do now to just to change the way people work? Can can we take it out of not just what we put on the firefighters, but maybe what we train the firefighters to do so that they can avoid the smoke, however they do that, whether it's through ventilation or suppression or, or realistically coordination between the two is yeah. is the best uh, approach. And I think you also hit the nail on the head because it, in that it's, it's a difficult concept to wrap our heads around because it's not just for one thing, right? We, we need to determine how people are gonna work most effectively, but what is most effective at reducing risk for the occupants of that structure if they're there or yeah. what's most effective in reducing risk for the structure itself might be very different than reducing the risk for the exposures to that structure yeah. and reducing the risk for the firefighters themselves so we've looked a little bit at, at how what's the difference if you do a transitional attack and again putting a little water from the outside before going in versus an interior attack in terms of, of exposure for occupants and for firefighters and you know it, five years ago when we were at first talking about this there were people saying you had a transitional attack because that that's going to initially put water on the fire it's going to reduce that source term that's producing all of that bad stuff and that's going to reduce your risk there's other people who said well if you put water on the fire you're going to reduce the buoyancy of that hot upper gas layer you're going to drop that smoke yeah. layer down and you're actually going to increase the risk for the occupants of that structure and for the firefighters themselves so those are that you know both groups were really looking at this how can we protect first and foremost the occupants of the structure yeah. that, that's that's typically what yeah what absolutely these decisions have to start with yeah. if they're there we might have to take on some other risk to structures or exposures or to the firefighters in order to address that highest level, that life safety risk, right? But if there is no life safety risk, if we've got the exposures protected, if, 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 as you go through that checklist of your priorities, now we can start to say, okay, what can we do maybe to avoid that smoke if we have all those other things taken care of? And we found that by, by putting water on the fire, we're not, we didn't find any indications of increasing the risk for occupants of that structure within that study. We also found a slight improvement in terms of, of what was in the, the firefighter's urine, some of the markers of exposure to, to compounds like pyrene. 
we found that there was a slight reduction when using that transitional attack. It wasn't a, a mass, it wasn't orders of magnitude difference, but, but it was enough to show that changing the way you work can change the exposures that you face on the fire draft. Um, after you've made that holistic decision about which tactic to employ, that doesn't mean that you should always employ the transitional attack because it might slightly reduce your exposure yeah. to hiring, but it's something that you can include in that decision process wherever it's appropriate in, in the hierarchy that your department has has put together. But we also found that you know most people thought that we were going to greatly reduce the, the heat stress on the firefighters by doing a transitional attack, right? You do that, you don't have as much heat being produced by the fire. No. So you put water on the fire, yeah, no difference, absolutely none, because in that case it was the metabolic heat generation. You're still dragging hose all around yeah. the structure. You're still going out. It doesn't, didn't matter what that environmental temperature was for, for that room and contents fire scenario we were running, it didn't affect your, your core temperature. So we can start to address some of these questions. So from a hierarchy of controls perspective, that transitional attack didn't really do anything in terms of, of affecting your, your, your risk no. from a heat stress perspective, but it did have some noticeable effect in terms of, of exposure to a few of the contaminants, not all of them, but a few of them. So now we can start to make, put that, that order of magnitude in the context of how much will this impact occupants of the structure, yeah. structural stability, exposures, and what have you. No, but it's like you said, there is a, it, it would be nice, like the air, the aircraft industry is very good at this Swiss cheese approach, looking at all the slices that went wrong. And the fire service is, <laughs> Due to due to ignorance, most of the time, um, just but we're not used to looking at the problem and looking at we want to find a problem like a that was the problem at this fire you know like no that, that was a chain like there's multiple there's training issues there's there's PP issues there's tactical issues like command issues and so on so there's this, this chain that needs to that all they all need to align to to make a get a bad outcome just the same way as you, they all need to align to get a good outcome. Like to perfect right. fire, everything has to match up. But again, like you have this, like when you have this trade-off problem, I see that you can potentially get, if we're just looking at the PPE design, you can get improvements, I think, to that trade-off generally. But the most improvements, I think, is like tactically right now, just to... For, for instance, take a, a, what, what would be a much bigger difference if you have departments that are still thinking about what should I do first? If I can only do one thing first, should I go for search or should I go for fire attack? This, this, that's still a question a lot of people ask themselves. I Meaning if I go to search, I would try to find people, of course. If I go to fire attack, I will try to fight the fire. But now to me, I would definitely choose to go to fire. N not looking at you know contaminants and so on but just looking at it, the faster i get water on the fire the faster i can ventilate the first the faster i can ventilate the better the conditions start to become for tracked occupants um but that that if you look you can add on the work safety uh, uh part of that also which is of course the immediate threat of fire which is if you don't do anything right. about it it will become a problem but again the long term long-term effects also points you to that direction saying that the faster we get water on the fire the faster we can ventilate the less stuff that you will you will start to, to be exposed to so again what's good for us is is probably also good for the tracked occupant you know the less we're in there and so on if, if you're not comparing well the, the best for us is to stay outside well well yeah that's true <laughs> in that case there's no correlation between what's good for us and the tracked occupant but but generally on the inside, what's good for them is also good for good for us. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I think that that's a, a relatively consistent message that we've been been yeah, finding in, in all these studies, whether it's related to the heat stress, the firefighters' chemical exposures, and, and really importantly, the great deal of effort that's put it been put into what is going on with the occupants inside that structure. Yeah, is the faster that we can get water on the fire. Uh, again, it, it's not about the transitional versus the interior attack. No, it is whichever of... one can get the water yeah. on the fire 
rapidly. And the reason I believe that we had that difference was that you were able to put water in the scenarios that we tested a little bit more rapidly, could knock the fire down more quickly with that exterior attack. There might be scenarios where the fastest way to get water on that fire is through that front door or whatever well, that approach is. Yeah. is. yeah. And, and, and agreed, it, it makes sense. That the, the source term, the bad stuff, is not going to stop being produced until we actually get control over that fire. And we can certainly have some effect by reducing that as long as we can go in and eventually mop it up. Yeah. But getting water on the fire uh, is, is one of the most critical, if not the most critical thing that we can do from a health perspective when we're on the fire ground for, well, for everyone involved. you can also involved. increase the fire. That would also decrease the amount of bad stuff produced. Absolutely. <laughs> Which is, well, it's true. I mean, if you have a big rock in industrial fire and you pour gasoline on it instead, that will probably affect the environment less than if you start putting a lot of water on it, because that will create some bad stuff, both in the ground and in the air. Yeah. You know, and then now you're getting into how, how efficient is the fire itself, right? Yeah. Because we know these yeah. fires are really in a inside structures that we're fighting right now, vent limited fires, you're gonna have some some uh, incomplete combustion, which yeah. is gonna produce some more scary things and oftentimes some bad chemicals that, that we know are not good for people yeah. or for the environment. So, yeah. so you, don't you either wanna yet. suppress the fire as fast as possible, or you wanna make it a really rocking fire. I, I think we typically tend towards putting putting out as fast as but possible. The, <laughs> well, well, it is. I mean, Sweden is definitely a tactical option. So, man, like, like, say, if you have a trash trash bin on fire, or you have a somewhere where if you flush a lot of water on it, it will create more bad stuff in the air, and and most importantly, in that case, more more pollutants would go down the ground with the with the water. So, let's say you have a fire on a drinking water source when you have below the ground like that would be a that would be a, a pretty clear case of if you don't have to put it out because if, you know if there's interior if there's people inside of course you put it out but if there's no people inside just let it burn because that's the that's the least impact on property and environment as it could be now that's a different question so we're not going to go down that route but I have still many more questions. <laughs> uh, first off, uh, we, we talked about, first off, I, was, I just want to clarify this. A water barrier like, like uh, Gore-Tex or any vapor barrier, if you want to call it that, would it be practically correct to say that that's also a particle barrier in terms of, of contaminants that are in particle form? So, uh, it would not be technically the, the term that would be so typically the, the particulate barriers that are being used in in hoods uh, yeah. are not necessarily the same thing that would be the moisture barrier inside the gear itself but the the moisture barrier would likely be uh, and i've not seen any tests on this so this yeah. is just my assumption based on, on my understanding of that layer yeah. that it, you're not going to get particulate penetration through those moisture barrier materials now they're using different, slightly different uh, formulations for the hood from what yeah. I can, can understand. So the, a particulate barrier is different than a moisture barrier, but same basic concept. And the moisture barrier inside the coat, you're, you're not gonna get a whole lot of particulate penetration through, through that gear. So. No. Now, the, the, the place where we're concerned about penetration of particulate in the gear is around the interfaces. So yeah. between the coat and the pants. Uh, around the hood and the coat, and, and even in the cuffs, you know, around the, the wrists and, and up the legs. But they are viewed typically as two different things um, in, in terms of, of the manufacture of the gear. So if I put myself, if I produce a body sock of a vapor barrier, and then I put my PPE over that, I at least I should be in theory more protected against particulates. Uh, in theory, I imagine that you would, you know, it, as you're adding layers, you're going to have more protection. You know, yeah. we, we've done some studies looking at, you know, a two layer knit hood, you know, in what concentration do we find in the outside layer versus the inside layer, even without any sort of, yeah. of, of barrier in there. Yeah. And you see the outside layer actually, I don't know, filter may not be the right term here, but you have a much higher concentration of, of particulate on the outside layer of that hood than you do on the inside layer of that yeah. hood. 
and in, in the same conditions. And we've also tested some where you, you have that particulate barrier in there. Yeah. And these are some, some uh, uh, commercially available hoods and yeah. that thin layer, basically there's nothing that gets yeah. through to that inner layer that gets through it. That doesn't mean that people don't still get exposed by things coming up and around it, but that additional layer yeah, certainly so acts as a, a, another, another layer that we'll keep. Now we never did a three layer hood. It would be interesting to see what happens if you had that third layer that isn't a moisture barrier. So a third knit layer, Yeah, uh, it would likely have even less that comes through it. Yeah. Uh, but then you're also starting to get bulkier and all, all those other trade-offs. So yeah, again, yeah. why the hood yeah. being evolved now is to try to reduce that penetration of particulate while also, I mean, think about how much you, you need range of motion of your neck yeah. in order to look around yeah. and do things a lot of heat that gets lost through your head, being able to put it on and take it off. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that the hood has to do for something that, you know, right now they're in dollars, you can get some for, for $30 up to, yeah. you know, maybe even a couple hundred dollars for these, these very high end hoods. So, you yeah, know, no, there's a, there's a, there's a, you know, there's a study in Norway now looking at it and, and the, the final report is not done, but the, what, from what I've heard about the initial test, the, uh, the particle hoods, again, I would say moisture barrier hoods, but <laughs> but the particle hoods uh, show the same initial results that, you know, very good results in, in terms of at least stopping particulates. And again, yeah. gases are different things and so on, but, but at least you're stopping something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. from getting through. Well, we've seen in, in, in the U.S., they're, con they're called particulate barrier hoods. That, yeah. That's the NFP. That's the term that is, is commonly used within NFPA uh, as opposed to. So, again, it, it just indicated as a different material. Yeah. It's not the same as moisture barrier. No. But, yeah, they, they are, are, are uh, quite effective at reducing what gets through them in everything that I have seen. Uh, but again, that's not the only way that yeah. particulate can get out of your skin. No. <laughs> so the, the, the thing is, because I, I'm 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 pretty I'm fairly interested in underwear. So I mean, typically, I mean, if we go back in the day, it was all cotton because cotton mm -hmm. was because uh, it was not fly. This didn't melt, you know, thermal for right. thermal right. reasons, right. and it, you know, absorbed uh, moisture, which was considered to be a good thing, and then. Then we started getting in Sweden, we started getting, you know, like more, you know, sweat wicking materials, but high performance. So they were, they had a very high melting point, but so they were, they were rated for firefighting, but they were made to wick sweat away from your mm -hmm. body to be more comfortable. Um, uh, and then you have wool, which has made a comeback, a strong comeback as a material from the looks, pure natural wool. It's very popular in Norway, I know. They, they've been using wool for ever and ever, um, uh, sort of like, because they're a strange country with lots of money. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're sort of like our Canada, but because but but if you just had a much richer Canada, um, <laughs> well, they're really nice. Uh, but anyway, so uh, they've been using wool. So I've had a, like I, I, do, I do a lot of firefighting, so I want you know what personal to protect myself, and I've had this this practical problem. I've traveled all over the place, and and I get, I borrow stuff when I travel because to to bring it with me is uh, sure I can bring it with me, but then I have to wash it and travel with it. It's just a a logistic nightmare. So I borrow stuff, but then I've had a question because I get borrow different kinds of stuff, different PPE, different clothes, but also different underwear, and I get different kinds of underwear, and and. Then I started interesting myself, but you know, what types of, of materials am I actually wearing, for what reason, and how are they washed? Um, because I was starting to read a lot of reports about. Okay, so you wash PPE, you wash your PPE, your outer skin, and that it's not necessarily becoming more clean after you wash it. I've seen results on washers and different different uh, agents and then you you start washing it and did you just transfer the the this crap from the outside to the inside through the washing process so i'm going like okay i'm going around the world and, and i don't know how they're being treated and how they're being washed and which machines and what results they're getting so i i assume that all the pp i get is contaminated on the inside okay so i need something that's clean on the inside okay so but if if the process of wa washing the underwear the whatever you have underwear is also not 
good. Then I'm also wearing contaminated gear. So I'm, I'm at the, after one burn, of course I'm contaminated, but am I, am I be, am I for a week's course, am I being contaminated every time I'm in the classroom, even though I think I have clean gear? So my question to you first off, from a, from a particulate and clean, ignore the thermal threat because that doesn't worry me. I don't have a problem. You know, if my skin is at the temperature where synthetics are melting, I, I deem to myself to have other problems <laughs> and I've done something wrong. But but let's, like I say, I have latex gloves below my gloves. And, and if my hands are that temperature that the latex is melting on my skin, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I've done something wrong. <laughs> That's my only, only say about that. But, but in terms of using wool, uh, cotton, and synthetic different synthetics that wick uh, sweat away from you and so on, from a particulate and, and gas perspective, and from a, um, a from a thermal uh, protective in, in terms of heat stress, have you ever looked at different materials? <laughs> Well, um, we have not looked at, so just to take a couple of steps, even even back from where you are looking at different materials, yeah. we're, we're trying to understand specifically what is the value of those base layers in terms of, of protection. Uh, it's actually a study we have ongoing right now. We, we uh, technically should be doing data collection uh, this summer. Unfortunately, it, it's been delayed as a result of, of uh, you know, the ongoing travel restrictions that we have yeah. in the U.S. right now. But just to understand what is the difference between if we just have cotton, what are we measuring outside of that cotton versus under the cotton? What is the additional protection from the uh, the soot, you know, both particulate and vapor phase from having that additional layer? Uh, there was uh, a, a study from Wingforce up in your area that, that seemed to uh, sh indicate that there, there was, they had very relatively higher worker protection factors, which meant a, a higher reduction in the contaminants from outside of the gear to under the gear, because they were measuring underneath that base layer, whereas some other studies had measured the, the, uh, the levels between the bunker gear and, and the base layer. So we're just trying to understand, first of all, if someone's wearing shorts and a t-shirt versus long sleeve and a long, long pants, is that going to provide some level of protection just if, we, if we're using a base layer of cotton alone? Yeah. And so that's data that we are hoping to still collect sometime this year, if not early next year. So you're asking a question right now that, that we don't have a solid answer for. It most certainly appears that it should reduce some of the particulate uh, because it would filter some of that before yeah. it gets to to the base layer. Still trying to understand the vapor. Um, it, it possibly could have an impact there as well. The next question is you're asking is then what, what is better? What if we choose something other than than cotton? Yeah. Uh, if we go to the wool or we go to some of these these uh, fabrics, are they are they better? Um, and and so we're we're not to that level yet. <clears throat> at least I'm not aware of any study that has looked at those different materials for the base layer on the, the contaminant perspective. Denise has, uh, Denise Smith has done some research looking at different base layers from a heat perspective, yeah. heat stress perspective, comfort per, comfort perspectives, and, and there are differences there, you know, uh, particularly in the comfort. And quite often we see a lot of those differences that she found were not necessarily during the firefight because you're in a fully encapsulated yeah, uh, right. environment, but it's during the rehab. It's when you take the gear off and you have some of those wicking materials as opposed to a cotton that might hold yeah. the moisture in for a longer period of time, where you can have some of those differences in, in the base layer when it's allowed to help, when, when some of them might help you cool off more than others or recover more rapidly yeah. or just be more comfortable than the others. So that that data set is out there. There's some great work going on at the Florida State University uh, to do some work on, on base layers right now and some of the work that Denise Smith has done. But uh, we're hoping to at least address what is the value of, of long yeah. base layer versus short base layer so we can, can make that distinction. <clears throat> Once we understand that, then, then we can start maybe thinking about the different materials, how they might help one or the other. So so I, I, I don't know that I'm at least not aware of anything yeah at this point that can address that question. So we have um, the standing recommendation in Sweden has been it started. I mean, long johns having long, long, long sleeves and long uh, 
legs has been because that was part considered part of the thermal protection back in the mm -hmm. day. So you you had to have that going on the call. Now that eroded when the thought that thermal protection is not the primary concern. So then people start wearing t-shirts and so on. But then again came the 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 particular concern. So now that's brought back that you need you need the more layers you have the better it is. That's the general consensus. Now how how safe how, how secure that is in 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 science I don't really know but but, but I think it's I think there's at least I can recall seeing some data on it. So there's at least been, you know, back half backyard science on it that it supports the claim. So yeah. that's long jump. But again, looking at, uh, you had a remark. Oh, no, I just no. said I, there, what you mentioned about uh, being part of the thermal protection, that, that's often ignored it, in many cases. Many people don't necessarily take into account the level of thermal protection provided by that layer underneath and particularly oh, with, in Illinois you, you'll have you know very hot summers and very cold winters so people are showing up for the volunteer fire departments in very different uh, clothes that they're wearing underneath yeah. there from you know shorts and t-shirt to maybe multiple layers in, yeah. in the winter <clears throat> and that makes a huge impact in terms of uh, of the heat loss as well as the uh, the thermal protection yeah uh, I believe there's some work going on at North Carolina State to, to try to get a, a better handle on that from, from a heat strain perspective um, that, that could provide a little bit of modeling as well as some, some experimentation. But uh, yeah, it, it's, it, it is something that we often don't take into account how, um, how the things that we're wearing underneath the gear does impact all of those other, um, in, in a real manner, does yeah. it impact its ability and its thermal protection. I know that in, in the early days, like in the 80s and 90s, it was actually because the gear was rated with underwear. Like, like it, 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 was, it was part of a system. Really? So, okay. so that, and that, that went away when they spec'd the outer gear to perform all of that duty. So the outer gear became heavier and, and thicker because of you, people didn't want to have, because if you're walking down station, you're not walking around in long johns and a long mm -hmm. sweater. You had to take that on when you went on a fire call and that was a pain in the ass. So you spec the outer Hi. shell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so the, the outer shell has to perform all of the duties so that you can be ba basically bare naked under it. But again, that is brought back now with the with the thought of a particulates that you should have long long sleeves and long long legs, and that should be washed. Now the general consensus in Sweden now you wash your PPE in one machine and you wash your underwear in another machine. Both are considered to be dirty. You don't wash anything else there, but you don't mm -hmm. want to mix those two because again you don't want to transfer transfer those particles. Yeah. But one of the arguments I heard first off, I think wool is excellent. It's it doesn't burn, doesn't melt. It's it's super comfortable, like it wicks naturally away from your body. When you when you come out of a training burn, I mean, cotton you just freeze because it's just miserable, especially in winter. In cotton, you don't feel as nearly as bad. Um, but then one thing I read, which I, I don't think maybe you don't have as much in, info in, but there's been lots and lots of washing studies in Sweden because now there's washing machines in every fire station. So wash, this washing of gear is extensively, at least on backyard level, tested in Sweden and so on. And it seems to be a correlation between that you're able to wash it at high temperature which is a problem because okay. fabrics degrade much more at, at higher temperature. So it's been a push to go lower and lower and lower on temperature to not wash your gear to pieces. Mm -hmm. But now it seems, and I mean, it's not strange that, that higher temperatures wash the, the, the gear better. So in terms of underwear, if you can wash it in 60 degrees Celsius compared to 40 or maybe even 80 degrees, it gives you a better cleaning process, meaning that your base layer is clean when you actually put it on instead of contaminated. So if you have different materials, the ability to wash them at higher temperatures uh, seems to be an important factor to consider also. Yeah, yeah. The uh, There's just recently been a, a, a large increase in the number of, of cleaning studies uh, conducted here in the United States. Yeah. Um, we actually are going to have some, hopefully some papers out um, 
later this year that are looking at that. And one of the questions is what happens if you launder the gear, not not the base layer, but looking at, at bunker gear yeah. 40 times. So we, we, we laundered and we took a set out at 10, after 10 washes and at yeah. 20 washes and at 40 washes to see how that impacts the, uh, the protective properties yeah. of the gear, as well as looking at how clean does it, uh, how how effective is it cleaning? Yeah. Does that change over time? And so we've got some information out that, that's going to be coming out from that very soon. NFPA has done some work on, on how clean is clean, like how, yeah. how clean is it actually getting, yeah. and how can we test that so that there, there's a way to understand how clean it is when it comes out, not just in a laboratory environment, but something can be done repeatedly over time. Yeah. And then there's another group at North Carolina State that is looking at some things. What are some other ways we can clean? What what is the effect of temperature? We according to the standards in the United States, you know, the, the cleaning and drying of bunker gear has to be done less than 105 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, you know, somewhere around 40 ish C. Yeah. Right. So it, it's it's relatively low. Very and you low, think yeah. about some people who are in, in Arizona or Southern California, I mean that, that's their that's their summer their summer <laughs> yeah, temperatures yeah, exceed yeah. that. Yeah. So, but but that's that's in the standard. So they're trying to understand what is that, uh, how does that temperature impact uh, the cleaning ability as well as the, uh, the the potential degradation of some of these these fabrics. So there there is a lot of activity that's ongoing yeah. right now in in the U.S. But we're it's it's just scratching the uh, me, the surface. I think so there's gonna, one. Yeah. Sorry. So one, one that we study that we, we did have published at the end of last year uh, with our friends at, at NIOSH, uh, Alex Mayer was a lead on this, and it was looking at hoods. So we, we took hoods and we laundered some of these hoods. And, and one thing that we found was certain things come off pretty well uh, with the, the, the standard washing. And again, we're following the NFPA standards. I'm assuming it's relatively similar to, to how it's done in, in European standards. But we're, when we're washing these hoods, um, we noticed that uh, you know some of them would come in, particularly those who were on the on the attack line. You know they would be very heavily contained, the very dark soot color, and then come out and it'd be kind of a uniformly brown, even though when they first went in, you know the the, the netting on the the helmet would actually yeah. come across, and you could see the outline yeah. of that where the helmet. Uh, was resting on there and protected it. Well, after it comes out, then all of a sudden it's kind of a uniform brownish gray. Yeah. And we also found that, you know, now all of a sudden there's there's some other hoods so that have contamination on them. So we started putting some hoods, some brand new hoods in with this wash, and we found certain contaminants could cross-contaminate from yeah. the con heavily contaminated hoods, and, and these were pretty heavily contaminated, to some brand new hoods. Which would also mean from the outer shell to the inner shell yeah. of these, or the inner liner of these hoods. Yeah. It wasn't as much if you know the the things we think about most are PAHs, are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Yeah. Some of the the the, the soot-looking materials, kind of that that darker soot that we see. We actually saw a very good removal of these PAH, and those are the, the, the contaminants that include things like benzoapyrene, which is a, a known carcinogen, and, and other materials within that class that are, are potential and possible carcinogens. Laundry did a pretty good job removing those. What we didn't see as good of a job removing, and we saw a little bit more cross-contamination from, was actually some of the flame retardants. So when we we're doing actual structure fires, you're not going to see flame retardants in pallet and straw or, or, or you know, uh, training fires using at least natural materials. Yeah. But you'll find some of these flame retardants in typical room and contents in the United States because yeah. that was part of, of some of the standards that many of those those furnishings had to, to pass. Yeah. Those are the things that we would see. And the take home from there is, is, you know, if you can, don't launder the heavily contaminated hoods with the lower contaminated hoods. Don't launder your hoods. Some people were thinking, well, these are very similar yeah. to the base layer. And, and no, you, you want to keep those separated. Another reason why we need to separate the outer shell from the inner liner in, in, in all of our gear, you can snap out that inner liner. Uh, but it's a step that you have to take to remove the inner liner, which is in contact with your skin from the outer shell, which is going to have that heavier level of contamination. If those just go in the wash together, now you have the possibility of, of transferring some of that contamination from the outer shell, which you won't touch at least nearly as often, to that inner liner that can be in contact with your skin, which then makes it potentially 
and I'd say potentially available for transdermal uh, contact. We, we're still trying to understand if we sweat and we have this this uh, this hood that has this contamination, can the sweat then extract it off and get it onto the skin, or or is will it then come from that hood onto the skin itself? Yeah. We're still trying to understand that, but you at least have contaminated. We know that we can at least transfer that contamination from the dirty side to the clean, clean side. side. Yeah. So that, that, that is important to, to consider. How do we eliminate that cross-contamination? So separating out a, a, a washer just for the gear and a washer just for the, um, the base layer or your station uniform or whatever that is that you're wearing, that's, that's really important separating the liner from the outer shell so that you don't have those contamination, uh, th those compounds cross-contaminating from one to the other. It, it, it appears that that is a, a important thing, particularly when we're dealing with uh, your flame retardants and some of those other materials. Not only that, the, the heavy metallic components that you find in the outer shell, that moisture barrier is a relatively delicate uh, piece of, of material, right? You don't necessarily want to have those heavy metallic clasps banging on that, uh, that moisture barrier as it's tumbling in that washer and in that dryer. Yeah. So separating them out uh, appears to be quite important. Um, it's, it's something that's been in best practice in the NFPA selection care and maintenance document um, and something we're becoming much more aware of, uh, of, of the value of, of separating those out and the risk for that cross-contamination. Yeah, and that's again, where just oh yeah, well, Matt, I think and that's where the reality hits in that you know people go okay, so now we need to buy three different washing machines to every station: one for PP, one for the liner, one for the the, the base clothes. Plus, we have to have a normal washing machine for everything. It's not you know one yeah. in fire. So you have this 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 practical problems where it starts to cost money. Um, but I, I, yes, I, I would say that you, those findings that you say about, you know, like cross contamination, they're definitely reproduced in Sweden and, and, and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and also the, the, the findings with flame retardant is the same. And that also goes for new PPE, which has to be washed before you use them because new PPE has a lot of bad stuff on them. So un unwashed. Okay. Is that something that, that you guys have had some studies looking at yeah, what's coming yeah. out of the, the wash from fresh gear? Yeah. Yeah, yeah Un, that's not something we've seen. Your, yeah, that's really, really nasty stuff. Okay. Yeah, it was, it no, was, it was, it was, it, it was found because they did a base test. Okay. So they did a base layer test. They did wash, they looked at new clean gear versus heavily contaminated. And the new clean gear had more flame retardants and pH H levels than the, than the <laughs> heavily contaminated wow. gear. Yeah, it was, it was wow. really bad. It was really bad. Now that doesn't go for all gear. That was just from that manufacturer, but they've done more tests since then. And they see that there's a cross, there's a cross thing that pretty much all manufacturers, at least in Europe, uh, and I don't know, not all, there's many, but many manufacturers in Europe have on new gear. There's, there's tons of contaminants because it, it, they're wow. used in the, in the making the gear, uh, in the waterproof manufacturing process. Yeah. So, yeah. and there's a big conversation in the U S as well about, about the, the durable water repellents. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, it, you obviously need to have some gear that is water repellent, but, yeah. but again, it is, what is the trade off between the risks from some of those materials? And there, there's, that's another area where there's a lot of research going on right now. And, and hopefully within, within the next few months, there's going to be some new uh, data being produced or being published by a, a couple of different sources in the U S that are, are looking at things like that. So uh, I'm looking forward to, to understanding that because we, we've got a lot of discussion that, that's something right now where there's a lot of, of concern. Um, and it will be great to have some numbers to really understand, um, understand what you're saying there, because uh, that, that's not something that, that I have, have seen um, a repeatable study being done on that. But, but again, it, the awareness that, that has to be understood is there. And, and there's a lot of research, I think, that's going on right now. So we'll know a whole lot more o about what our risks are and then hopefully what we can do to, to potentially reduce some of those risks yeah. in the very near future. I, I just know that there's the recommendation was at least wash wash new gear once before they're used. Okay. Um, 
to to flush away some but you have this problem also that you you measure like you say ph ph pah <laughs> materials and stuff like that and when you wash them you measure the water coming out of the dishwasher and you look at okay so wash it once you get this and there's a two you get less and less and less and then you get down to a level where you say well now it looks clean but then you measure on the actual jacket and you're still left with a lot of stuff so <clears throat> and that's where what what detergent are you using inside the washer and which temperature are you washing it and how does the cycle wash through then you you reach one of the other ones that that trade off you can either wash it really well and it will survive for five washes and then it's totally destroyed or you can wash it very nicely and you maybe survive a hundred washes before you need to replace it but ba basically now we're washing our gear to pieces is they're not being destroyed by fires and, and and wear and tear they're being destroyed by washing yeah so I, I think in our studies we're, we're definitely seeing some you know the tear resistance of, of the outer shells can can be impacted uh, by repeated laundry uh, yeah. I, I, and i don't think that's a, a surprise um you know again that you have a a high-tech fabric that's intended to do a whole lot of things but but there is going to be some impact from uh, the cleaning procedures which is why there there rightly is a whole lot of of, of research going on in that area yeah. now, the, the group at nc state that i was talking about they're they're looking at carbon dioxide liquid carbon dioxide cleaning mm -hmm. you know, there, there's a lot of other other uh people that are looking at different ways we might be able to clean yeah. these uh the, these uh these fabrics so we, i think this is a, one of those areas that's going to evolve greatly over the next you know few years and 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 we'll figure out what is that right level uh in terms of improving our ability to clean them but also reducing that impact on uh, on the material itself in terms of at least it harming it, its its protective properties okay so you have nine minutes you need to <laughs> okay go. so now i have to do some quick quick fire questions Okay, okay, first, gross decon. Uh, soaking people after a fire, meaning gross decon, like with water and, and bushes outside the outer PPE, are you in favor or not? I, I'm in favor uh, of the gross decon. Uh, again, with the right amount of practice and, and uh, the right technique, you can keep the water on the outside. It can clean the firefighters off of the surface. Yeah. We've found you can get about 85% of that surface. And again, just focusing on PAH contamination yeah. off uh, with a relatively small investment uh, and um, and relatively low amount of time, you know, two to three minutes per person to, to get that done. And there's a lot of people who are, who are trying to figure out how to do it even uh, more yeah. efficiently than that. I think for the the cost um there's a high return on investment and it, it's part of the uh the overall risk reduction process that being said i would not say we, it has to be done every single time you have to understand what's the yeah. environment you know is is it really reducing your risk or if it's to the point where you're going to create uh, ice flow problems and yeah. you have uh, increased risks from yeah. from the environment or or if you're forcing people to stay in that gear for 10 minutes when it's you know 100 degrees fahrenheit out you yeah. know there, there's other risks so i think in general if yeah. it can be done you can reduce those risks and get rid of some of those contaminants before the gear gets taken back to the station and and reduce the transport uh, of that that contamination back so I'm I am in favor of it, and and we we did it um, at Savoy Fire Department. We we do it when we're doing uh, testing at, at UL, and and have been through decon lines in, in freezing cold and, and and really hot days, and um and, and I I'm I'm definitely for it under the right circumstances. Yes. So about the dry wipe, you saying brushes and fans to to dry wipe on out out uh, on. The outer shell dry decon dry decon we we did not find a whole lot of, of impact on dry decon um mm -hmm. you know in the study we did we didn't we weren't able to remove much with an air flush and that was really a, a leaf blower that was modified yeah. to try to blow off contaminants yeah we did get about a 25 percent reduction with a brush uh, which 
and again, if, if nothing else, that, that's better than nothing. The, the problem is that that kind of kicks everything back up into the air. So yeah. you have to make sure that there's respiratory protection for you know the people who are doing that work. Yeah. But a lot of the stuff that we're seeing, uh, th these pHs are kind of sticky. Yeah. So without having that soap that can help bind to them and the brush that can get them off, a lot of those things stick around until you use something that can get in there and, and wipe those off. So the brush, if, there, if, if you don't have anything else, it did provide some reduction. And it's also really useful if you have a lot of building materials, like if you're covered in, in drywall or, or insulation, yeah. ceiling insulation that's dropped down. You can get a lot of that off and, and take care of that. But but again, anytime you're using that dry approach, you got to be careful of what is getting back into the air, um, particularly if there's any indication that there was asbestos in the environment. That 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 is something you have to uh, take the pr appropriate precautions in that case. So I would I would typically defer to the wet decon if it can be feasibly uh, conducted. And wet wipes. For the skin? Yeah, wet wipes for the skin. First off, just normal baby wipes and compared to special wipes. So made it... Yeah, this study that we conducted, you know, this is actually before the specialty wipes were, were really yeah. available and, and used. We found, you know, 54% reduction on the skin using big box store commercial available uh, skin cleansing wipes. Yeah. Um, there is work going on right now to try to look at some of these other wipes that are, are fire specific um and there uh i don't know what the data is yet out on those to but to see what is uh the improvement uh yeah. with some of those special formulations but there's a whole lot of other things besides the chemistry you know some of them are, are larger so yeah. you can uh, you, instead of having to use multiple wipes you can use one large wipe uh some of them have have different uh treatments in the skin or that, that can help um, other aspects of, of the cleaning process. So the take home message from our initial study is you can get half of that contamination, at least half of that contamination yeah. off of your body almost immediately. It's not perfect, so we still want people to get back and get showered and get cleaned as quickly as possible. And even if you don't want to use wipes, you know, finding a way of washing, bringing yeah. soap and water to the scene so you can wash your hands and, and your neck with a washcloth. But the wipes are really convenient, really easily transportable. Um, and there, there's a lot of work going on. There's a lot, those manufacturers are really trying to figure out what they can do to improve the efficiency of those wipes and to, to, to make them a, a better product. So I don't yet know how much better they are than than the um, the generic skin cleansing wipe. Yeah. But either one of them are a relatively low cost way that we can start to reduce that contamination immediately after the fire fight, during bottle changes, going into rehab, you know, whenever it is. So so I think I think that's something that's well worth the investment. Very commonly done now in the United States, as was done, you know, in my department in Savoy as well as at our, our um, the research burns we do with UL. And I only have three minutes, but then you can ask the question about sawing us after fire. So to, to, to the context in Sweden is we, we pretty much all fire stations in Sweden have sawn us. They have yeah. used for heat training, like after physical training, you're going to the sauna to, to, to basically torture your body into enduring more. You, you enhance the physical training. You also enhance your heat tolerance. Now it, it yeah. was never used like that for the closest 20 years because i mean it was more extreme back then you know more deeper thicker gear heat tolerance training we're badass fire here right. dragon slayers um but then it was also part of culture but now it's being used yeah. for decon and the anecdotal mm -hmm. thing is that if you've been to a fire of that, that matter training fire you would smell from your skin for two three days right. But if you go yeah. into a sauna straight after fire, after you take your shower, of course, then you go into the sauna, you you don't smell anymore. Yeah. So the anecdotal one was, I will just do sauna because I don't smell like a chimney when I get home to my wife, transferred into, I think I'm cleaner. Uh, yeah. But then the question of course is, is opening your pores like while you're doing firefighting just increases the the, the contaminants going inside or are you actually getting stuff out yeah you asked me this question in three minutes this is this is a three-hour conversation <laughs> yeah, and I, I started with that one <laughs> yeah. well i you know 
this is this is probably the most asked question that that I've received over the past few years. Yeah. Um, and there is some new information that's coming out. Jeff Burgess at the University of Arizona uh, did release a paper this year that is, has looked at that specifically after training fires. They were looking at um, at what was found in, in markers of exposure to the firefighters, and and they found that there was a slight reduction. But it wasn't significant. It was not a statistically significant. There wasn't enough of a difference in order okay. to say, yeah, we can, we can reliably say that there's a difference. But enough to say that this this deserves a little bit more research. We need to understand this a little bit a little bit farther. Anecdotally, what, what you said, we hear that over and over again. Yeah. Um, that, that people don't smell. One challenge there is, is the things that we smell are not necessarily the things that yeah. are, are yeah. bad. We, we, we use those as marking up. I've been exposed. I can smell it. That doesn't mean that just because you get rid of that smell, you get rid of all the other bad stuff. Yeah. But it doesn't also, you know, but we don't know that that's not the case. Yeah. The other thing that I would say is, first of all, a lot of people use it, it whether it's part of culture or, yeah. or the, for one reason or another, they feel better after they've gone through the sauna. Yeah. And there's value in that in, in terms of someone, whether yeah. it's relaxation, or whatever that is, there's value in that component it's a little bit harder to quantify than to be able to say, yep, we see this amount still in your body, whether it's in your blood or in your urine. Um, the only thing I would, I would, that I know that would concern me about this is, is to make sure we look at it from a holistic perspective. We know that firefighting dehydrates firefighters. We know that firefighting increases a core temperature and immediately going into another environment that may further that yeah. is something that we need to, very careful with so what are the protocols that are in place to ensure that you're not furthering any heat stress concerns with those individuals or or further dehydrating those individuals i think those are important things to make sure for those who are who are using saunas what are those policies that you have in place what are the protocols that you have in place to to think of it from a holistic perspective just like our discussion about ppe if we're driving down our risks in one area and raising up our risks in another is this a net benefit? So I, I think we're going to have another area where we have a lot more information here in, in a few years. Uh, but right now, I think make sure that we're keeping our individuals hydrated, um, making sure their core temperature is is uh, is not going out uh, of, of the area where we're kind of comfortable with it. Um, but if someone feels better afterwards, if there are some other benefits that we need to, to consider those as well. So, so here you that's right. the best I can do. Gavin says, if you're going to sauna, sauna with a temperature monitor up your bum. <laughs> so that's what, uh, no, that's, that's not your what final saying. message going to be. Is it your final <laughs> message? Uh, no, no. Uh, well, I, I want to add thing before we go about the sauna, because it, that hit me right. Because we were starting using saunas for decon, thinking it was good. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Uh, it, but it is. at least anecdotally. But nobody considered, and it took a while for me to start asking this question. I, I, I realized nobody else has asked that question before. Is well, if if contaminants are are disappearing in the sauna away from you, where are they going? And you know, so it's next time we're going to the sauna, we're we breathing last the last fire. Um, so the problem is that, like where do, where do they go? And and you know, like how do you clean the sauna after a fire? Yeah. Then like. Yeah. Uh, it led to us using towels more, meaning collect Which, sweat more in towels and then wash the towels. But do you get everything? No, because people lean against the wall and that becomes, you know, like that's the sweat and what's in the sweat, I don't know. And it's also a hot environment, it's very humid. So all the things that are in there is gonna get airborne, sort of feels like, like I don't I don't know, it's, it's um, but anyway, that's for saunas. Uh, I don't know where, where, where that leads. Maybe we're just yeah. removing the con contaminants from your body and then inhaling them instead. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's never like, like we began. It's not easy. It's right? never there's, easy. there's not a straightforward answer to any of this. No. And it's, uh, and, I, and I mean, it's a personal concern for me because I do a lot of fire training. So I, like, I, I don't know what to the implement, but I mean, the, the core fact is that I, I'm fairly aware of these things and how to do but i also know and i want to end on this i also want to consider that you know like smoking is still you know four or five times more dangerous than firefighting in terms of getting cancer 
So I mean, putting it in a perspective that if you if you implement a lot of easy changes that you can do regardless, like I don't it doesn't matter where I go, I can always make sure that I have some clean base layers uh, that are fully protected. So even though the outer layer is maybe not washed to to what I would like to see, uh, I can always use a face protection a particle particle mask and then of course use my SCBA as much as possible. I can always shower like within an hour. I can always make sure that my base layer is being clean, not use them again. Uh, right. I can always make sure that I spend as less time in smoke as possible. There's tons of stuff I can do when I go around the world uh, where there's little or no infrastructure for 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 cleaning gear and so on to protect myself and that everyone can do that and just your excellent videos on just donning PPE, like how do you took your 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 hood off without right. increasing exposure and so on. Right. Uh, just with yeah. the simple procedures like that, you can get a, like like a long way. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because that's that's one of the things that we're really trying to focus on right now is what are the simple relatively simple things we can do some of them require you know, maybe some retraining the way we've always done things yeah. you know, putting gear taking gear off and putting it on but you know valuing clean skin you know valuing a clean base layer all of those sorts of things they, they can be done and you're right that that is on you know an individual can can affect yeah. some of those things themselves and the other thing i would say that one of the most protective things that we can do in the fire service whether it's related to cancer, whether it's cardiovascular disease, mental health, even just our effectiveness on the fire ground is improve our fitness. It's one of the things that has been found across the board. The closest thing we're ever gonna find to a silver bullet is to improve the fitness level of, of our firefighters because it's been shown in the general population in massive studies well beyond the fire service to impact each of those major health and safety concerns in the fire service. It'll make you healthier, it'll make you safer, it'll make you a better firefighter if we can value uh, the fitness of our firefighters. In addition to diet, sleep, and all those other things that we know uh, impact the risk for development of cancer as well as cardiovascular disease. But fitness, in addition to that list of things that you mentioned, is one of the last things I'd like to, to leave with that, uh, that, that we can control uh, in some way, in many ways, and, and is something that can really be protective. So hopefully we can take those messages home and we can we can start to affect change with uh, with our, our home departments and improve our health and safety. So stay fit, stay clean, and sauna with a th thermometer up your bum. Would that be a good summary? I'll, I'll highlight the first two. You, you can go off that. <laughs> I'll take, uh, you know, I'm fairly good at the, the, the two first ones, but the third one, I haven't really tried yet, but, yeah, you know, I, Gavin I, I, said I, it, I'll, I'll try it. Uh, no, but it, uh, absolute pleasure, Gavin. I would love to talk more about some of the, some of the things about th these topics, but, but uh, I'll have to do right now. Three hours, All good right. talk. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity and uh, look forward to catching up with you again soon. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you very much.